We are back, Lenny Randall's Hot Corner. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and the host of the show is the esteemed, most interesting man in baseball, according to Rolling Stones, and um, his name is Lenny Randall. How are you, sir? I am blessed with no stress, and I'm thinking it's contagious now. Good deal, good deal tragedy in the country this morning. It's Monday morning, October 2nd, and um, we were just hit with the worst terrorist attack, uh, domestic or foreign, in U.S. history, Las Vegas, Nevada. What a mindfuck. You're close. You're in, um, you're in, Las, you're in Palm Springs. Yeah, my son went to UNLV University, uh, of uh, in Nevada, and it's kind of weird because I had 70 people call me for shelter. Some people are giving their homes up today. Some people are giving up their food. And, you know, Randall Cunningham, you know, these are not just named people, but regular people that have reached out to put their homes, they've posted them on Facebook as well, to reach out to get food, uh, families, if you need a place to stay, the Eastside Tannery, also in, in, in Las Vegas, one of the places that do a lot of stuff with us, and that's where the team stay. It's it's amazing that this is going on. I mean, we, we, you know, big brother in the sky, where are you? Yeah, um, something's going wrong, really. Mayday, mayday. Lenny, who did you bring as a guest today? And uh, I'm going to – I'm going to – I'm working on Troy. I have several people that want to come on, so I got to see who's going to pick up because I I can only do a three way. I've never done a four and five way. Have you ever? <laughs> um, there you go again, getting my heart beating. Those all okay. you have to do is men- mention little little expressions like that, and that's what it does to an old man like me. Okay, let, let me, me try this. I have Troy Percival. I was just with him, and. Uh, and a kid named Cody, who we're getting a scholarship to to play baseball in the process you tell, today. You tell Troy Percival that he <laughs> and I um, will be renewing old acquaintanceships. Troy Percival yeah. was originally a catcher with the Angels. Wow. Uh, I signed him to his, his tops contract, and he and I have an incredibly close mutual friend, uh, the late Howie Gersberg who was uh, his mentor in, I think it was indeed, Palm Springs when the Angels and uh, Howie decided to make Troy into a pitcher. And um, so we're talking about 35 years ago. How's he doing? He's doing great. He's actually a head coach now at University of uh, Riverside. University of California, Riverside, UCR head coach. He took over the position, bought a new batting cage, put up a new facility, put in, I don't know, maybe $20,000 worth of equipment and a uh, new shower, new lockers, and uh, they actually winning. they actually uh, doing great in the, in the pitching department. He's got an outfielder that, that throws 95 and a first baseman that throws 95, and he's going to use those two guys in relief. I thought that was phenomenal. For him to think that way, because a lot, a lot of managers don't think like that. Uh, Dodgers well, did with Sean Green. His that. own personal situation um, makes him think that way. His own experiences, um, yeah. being a catcher first. Yeah, right. Who comes to mind yeah. with that is Sean Doolittle, who Sean um, Doolittle. Yeah. he was a position player and became a, a pitcher, relief pitcher, and the A's traded him. I, Gee, I don't remember where he went this year, but he was doing very well. It might have been Cleveland. So remember uh, the Dodgers used Sean Green like that as well, the uh, right fielder and left-handed right. pitcher. Yeah, brought him in uh, for relief. Initially, as, as a pitcher, um, uh, yeah, 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 great fielder too, Sean Green, and yeah. uh, good New York Met. Liked liked him a lot. <laughs> Okay. Um, Lenny, tell me a little bit about your minor league experience with uh, old Washington, the new Washington Senators. Who was your first, uh, when you became a pro, um, who was your first coach? Who 
who welcomed you to pro ball, and what was the adjustment? I was in awe because Arizona State, when I, at Arizona State, we met 15 different major league managers and 15 uh, team players because we had exhibition games. So I met a lot of their players and managers in college before I became a pro. And fortunately, Bobby, Wink- you know, I met Bobby Winkles was your coach at Arizona. Yeah. Bobby Winkle was a good friend of Brooks Robinson, who was a good friend of Nellie Fox. It was an Arkansas connection thing going on there. And uh-huh. that they, they were mentoring. And then he was the one that got Ted Williams to come see me in college. So Ted Williams my first scout slash manager. And I'm in college, and I'm seeing him, and he's telling me I'll be drafted number one. And I'm like, uh, who is this guy? And they go, you don't know who that is? They go, no, it's Ted freaking Williams. <laughs> And I said, uh, uh, the fisherman. Your instruction <laughs> in college was as good as your instruction in your early pro years. Am I correct? I mean, you could, Winkles was a, a future major league manager with the, with the Angels. You didn't really have that much to learn uh, as an adjustment coming into pro ball. Winkles was a fundamentalist, and we had we had maxed on fundamental. I mean, we were the most fundamentally organized college program along with UCLA and SC, you know, the Pac-10 then was, you know, kind of a rival in, in, in uh, Arizona, University of Arizona, and uh, New Mexico, believe it or not. They had some pretty good AAA uh, college teams. The AAA level, for example, Craig Swan, Reggie Jackson, Sal Bando, um, Rick Monday, these are all AAA major league guys. They're right at the fence, both big league. Triple A, and all of them got a hundred thousand dollars to go right to the Oakland A's, you know, uh, Duffy yeah. and and and, and uh, B- Gary Gentry. So we had role models while we were being recruited by these guys. They're in college, get ready to go pro. In other words, and our uh, football season was over in let's say November, December, and we're recruited during, before the Christmas break to go to ASU to meet all these guys, and then there's spring training recruiting in February, and we're just before. Our, baseball season where we'd go visit some of the campuses, you know, Utah and so forth. And Winkles knew everybody. Everybody knew the number one winning program in the world was Arizona State University. So Winkles was a, a very close with all the GMs, with the Angels, the Dodgers, and so forth, because everybody was tapping, especially the Cubs, were tapping into his roster. Winkles was going, can we at least get him in class before you guys take him from me? Can we get him in the library? Before you get him a contract, it was seven to eight guys a season was going pro. Larry Gura, Larry Legro, Paul Ray Powell, uh, Alan Bannister, Floyd Bannister. It was just automatic uh, that five to ten guys would go go pro. And Fred Net 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 you know, family, you got to get your degree. You got to go to college. That was that was embedded in my head to get my degree. And if I didn't, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did. And Ted was pushing that. He goes, "I wish I had gotten mine." So you got to finish school. We'll bring you in, and if you don't finish, then we're gonna take you back and get you five or six units, and then we'll let you meet Dell Wilbur, who'll be your first manager. And Dell Wilbur, phenomenal to this day. I still talk with his son. He was the first Triple A manager who was like the. He was like. Uh, Rex Ryan, right. that kind of person, that bubbly, up tempo, humorous, you never out of the box. And we had a great team: Bill Madlock, Steve Greenberg, who owns the Mets, teammate, roommate. We did our tours to Europe together, and, and Cuba, and Puerto Rico, and we're on the world team. We had one of the best Pacific Coast League teams, and we won it all on the planet. And that was during the time of the thought of Steve Greenberg a lot. Steve Greenberg was Hank Greenberg's son. Am I correct? Hank Greenberg would mentor us about stocks and, and pro ball in college. Here's by Gimbel's, by Macy's, by Monster Field. We talked about the stock market with the legendary Hank Greenberg. Here's a guy who was a war hero. And we listened. He would go, look, guys, I'll see you on the road. Or I'll bring you to my Beverly Hills estate, and you know we'll play tennis while I mentor you guys on how to invest. Because <laughs> it's life after baseball. He goes, I make more money investing than I did playing with the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> we we listened, and you know his son was a lawyer. 
is a roommate, and he went to uh, Yale. And I go, Steve, so what are we doing? <laughs> we, you want ten grand or thirteen thousand? Look at your dad. We're in Beverly Hills. What are we gonna do? He goes, Well, we're gonna get some gimbal stock, and we'll make more money off the stock when we make in AAA or the big leagues. <laughs> we're making thirteen thousand dollars a month, Ralph. <laughs> and stop. And they wanted us to come to the big leagues. We didn't want to go. We stayed in Spokane. You were happy in the minors, no pressure. We were happy in the – oh, my God. It was amazing. We were, having some, we were going to Hawaii, uh, Albuquerque, you know, some good towns, that, that uh, Tucson. You know, it was a great road trip, and we were winning. We were having fun. Some people don't realize when you're a winner and you keep winning, it doesn't matter where you are. The money is not the thing. Sure, it's prestige to, to be in the big leagues and all that, but it's prestige just to get out of college and go pro and have that life, even if it's one day, 10 minutes, or 15 years. It's all an honor. It's all a privilege. We never took right. it for granted where, where we were. You know, if it was Somebody Hawaii. Somebody you to play a little boys game that you would have played, you'll play tomorrow for nothing if it, if it came down to it. Um, yeah, yeah. You have to look back and say, Oh, holy Toledo, I won the lottery of life. <laughs> the amazing thing about the lottery, Ralph, is we're, we're so unconscious of what the Hank Greenbergs and the Jackie Robinsons and the, and the Maury Wills, you know, eight years in the minors, they were making maybe 800 a month or 1,000 a year or 6,000 a year, a whole year. So anything we made in AAA, we were – we're like, guys, we're better than that era of the 60s and 70s. You know, we're better than the 50s and the 40s. So let's just suck it up and go play. Because we realize the history of what they sacrificed for us to make it double-A, triple-A, big league, because all those salaries would just trickle down. We had guys like Pete Broberg making ten grand a month in triple-A. Come on. Dan Stanhouse, five grand a month. That's good money anywhere in the country. I don't care where – I mean, and, and then another thing about it, Ralph, we had teammates, Cesar Tovar, uh, Tony Armas, Manny Trio. They would go, when this is over, guys, I'm going to take you to Puerto Rico. I'm going to take you to the Dominican Republic. Are you going to play in Caracas and be on the Caracas and you'll make five, ten grand a month like Dave Parker? <laughs> and we went, what? They're paying that kind of money in winter ball? So what? Was, and then we I, I, I never realized. I thought it was basically. Um, just kind of an excuse to get better. I know, I know everybody that played winter ball improved, um, but I didn't realize it was big bucks. Well, I could tell you stories you don't even know and never heard about regarding, you know, 2,500. I remember Pete McCannon. He was our, he's our manager and you know, now in Philly, and he was our teammate co-manager in AAA. He's a shortstop. Him and Toby Hara, battling for a position, and Jim Mason. So to, Toby goes, well, I think you should go to uh, Caracas, Venezuela, and work on your managing and, and, and shortstop skills. And he was always joking with him because he always goes, well, one day you're so cerebral, you're going to be a manager. And he would go, nah, I'm second string. I'm going to watch you guys. I'm dealing with it. I'm getting my degree while you guys are out there busting your ass. And we went, okay, so you're doing – Online, he was doing online college before online existed. Okay. Well, so we, we learned. Hey, who, yeah, was, who was the best high school player that you played against? We talked about your high school days okay. the other day. Who was the best high school player that didn't make it, that surprised you by not making it? And um, you're shaking your head because he could have been. Uh, somebody could have been a Lenny Randall. Well, it, it, we had about ten. I mean, because I, I go all the way back from Roy White to, to uh, Larry Todd, who was an Oakland Raider and a pitcher with with our high school and went on to Arizona State. I can go to Reggie Smith and his guys. There's like ten guys on that team. One guy was a clone, Willie Mays, named uh, Reamer, and Reamer. Uh, Willie Reamer was his name. We called him Willie Mays Reamer because he was that good at center field. He copied everything. Willie, I mean, the manners, the basket catch, hitting the opposite field, the helmet. Every, I mean, we went, guys, he's going to be awesome when he gets to the contract, get, like Roy White, Reggie Smith. Was he? I, he, he didn't make it. He, he didn't you know, you're not going to hear the guy, the guy that I mentioned. You're not going to hear about him because 
they either were in triple A or they played a year or two or something happened. Okay, but Reamer actually was signed in the pros. He did play in the yeah. pros. Yeah, and let me tell you some Bobby Bobby uh, Watkins, who's the guy you're probably never going to hear of, but he was he was as good as Kobe on the basketball court, as good as McNabb as a football quarterback, as good as um, Don Wilson was his mentor, and Nolan Ryan he they he got them ready, and you know you're probably not going to hear about him. He was a great athlete. He he was the greatest athlete. I mean, listen, Ralph. Bobby Watkins was so good that any there was no no team that um, if I I was I'd guard him I'd hold him at thirty points he would average in 40, 40, 50 points. I'm a DB defensive back guarding a guy that's going to do thirty plus every game. It's automatic with his eyes closed, and then he could throw a ball a football like it was a like a ping pong, you know, like he's a ping pong. Just I'm gonna place it over so there. I'm gonna throw it. How did his particular career stall? It, it 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 happened. You know, some guys can't handle triple A, double A, single A. You know, you go to Cocoa Beach, you go to Florida, you go to all these little hick towns, and you can't grow socially. It so it becomes a social problem. I just uh, you know, you're still dealing with you know, you live in California, you can sit in the back of a hotel, or you're in the back of the bus, or you're in the back of a room, or in the back of somebody's back, and you don't you don't like that. Or, or you have a cat thrown on the field or a dog thrown at you, a name calls. Some guys can't handle that. So some teams will go, look, socially I know you're not going to like, I don't want to name the cities, but you may not like it there, so we're going to put you in a more liberal city so your social activities will prosper along with your talent. And that's a big issue. Was Arizona but, uh, not, not among those in terms, uh, especially back then, in terms of um – Poor race relations. Let's put it put it nicely. To, to put it nicely, it, it wasn't always the fans. You know, it was the the surround. You know, you had to go eat somewhere. You know, you had to go eat at a at a Holiday Inn, or you had to go go eat at a Denny's, or you got to go at IHOP, and uh, you know, or wherever you went to eat. Sometimes it wasn't. You know, you see hot and spit in your food, or you see. The, the waitress actually dropped the French fry off the ground and put it back in your plate. I mean, you, you see stuff that you don't normally see or want to see and go, oh, I hope this pancake doesn't have, I hope that's butter and not spit. You know? Right. <laughs> this stuff, right. stuff that went, that go on and well, you go. I mean, I'm trying to put myself in your position mentally. You're like 23 years old, 22 years old at this, at this time. I thought all. I saw um, it all, man. I saw it all. Fight it off, man. How do you fight that waitress? The memory of that waitress who intentionally uh, puts a, a French fry back on, on the plate, and just her look, her her demeanor, knowing that she had kids, <laughs> you know, that uh, people like that are are out there. Um, you mentioned Hank Greenberg. You know, he was Jewish. I'm Jewish. Yeah. They didn't pick yeah. to him. He he had 58 home runs, and um, I, th- I think it was 37 or 38, maybe maybe a little. They didn't pitch to him. He could have he could have easily broken Babe Ruth's record, and they didn't pitch to him not because of anything other than um, he was Jewish. So a lot that went on against you was not against you. It's just you, your your race. I fought against, uh, you know, I had a guy named Dave uh, Culpepper. Uh, he was Italian. but And I fought against a lot of players, you know, that's an, at, at different ethnicities. It wasn't just an African-American thing or a Jewish thing or an Italian thing or whatever. I just saw it. You know, I, I even saw a guy <laughs> named Mike Shimskis, who was our – he was built like a Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he carried four to eight books in each arm. And we would go eat, and we'd go to, let's say, Pizza Place or Minder Bynes or Shakey's, and he, he looks Russian to the T. I mean, he looks straight German, Rus- you know, you know, just third world looking guy. And I go, Ship, how can you handle this? And he go, I don't let people bother me. Because Fred Cush recruited from all over the world. He recruited kids from all over the planet. And I go, Ship, how do you just 
to America, and how do you feel about your accent, you know, when you go to order? Because you don't sound, you know, I'm not knocking it. I'm just, how do you, I try to be as American as possible. I know that not, you know, being of German descent and Swedish, and I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a dog with, I'm a dog with a lot of issues. <laughs> you know, I go, well, what, what do you mean? He says, I take it out on the quarterback on the football field. Ah. Goes, uh, I take all that anger and all that frustration and I put it in my athletics and I look the other way because I can't let it bother me. You learn to look the other way. If somebody beats you and you beat you down, you look at them and you look in their eyes and you pray for them and you go, they have the problem. You don't. They have the issue. That sounds very Gandhi and all. all I know, and all that is holy. Most people retaliate, basically. Right. uh, Exactly. uh, And then if you retaliate, you're in jail. You're in jail. But deep down, you gotta be. You gotta burn. You gotta burn almost every day of your life. You see things, and uh, you know, the older you get, the more sensitive you get to it. And um, so, how did you deflate? The anger. How did you handle handle it? Because I, I was a psychologist. Cause I I studied psychology, so I would go. I'm going to leave this lady a, a twenty dollar tip for the, for the French fry on the floor. You see, I was taught small and with kindness, and I go, hey miss, uh, I know that something's wrong with that fry, but it's okay. I'm going to give you a tip, and I'm going to leave you four tickets to a game. So bring your kids and your husband or your mother and dad. So they can see the other side of life. They can see my mom have a good time. And then once that happened, it turned the seed. All of a sudden, I was getting free food. <laughs> well, right. All of a sudden. You're okay. I use reverse psychology. I use reverse psychology my whole career. I use it on umpires. I use it on every person that I could. Po- I was a Freudian historian. I loved Freud. I used to read all of his stuff, and uh, I used to read a lot of Norman Vincent Peale, and I used to read a lot of psychological warfare stuff that people did, you know, from Patton to, you know, because I was into the mind thing. So I, I study people, even even if an umpire, for example, he'd call a ball outside the way, and I know it's three, four feet outside. I'm going, I know i got to swing today because that guy's got a big plate or he doesn't like me <laughs> for whatever reason. So I grew up swinging at everything. We didn't re- look – in our neighborhood, Ralph, we didn't look for a walk. We weren't going to the big leagues walking. We went hacking. If the guy bounced it up there, we're going to learn to hit it. If the guy threw it from another airplane, another airport, or came from the back door, we're going to learn to hit it. We weren't learning to be gentle at the plate on life. It was a life skill every day for us. It was a life skill for you. It was a life skill for Steve and uh, and all the guys that I played, Bill Manlock. And, you know, we had. If Bill Manlock wouldn't swing the bat, he wouldn't have won four batting titles. Yeah, he could hit. You know, you, you don't get to the big leagues not hitting, Ralph. You get to the big leagues getting 150 hits in 150 games. You play 200 games, you get 200 hits. You score uh, 60 times, you play 60 games in college, you get 60 hits. We didn't think about All-American in the title. We went up there to hack, period, end of story. We were from hoods, valleys, wherever we were from, where we knew we couldn't do like Joe Morgan and get 100 walks. <laughs> Wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> was there a conscious? Was there a moment when you said it's gonna be baseball, not football, for you? Yeah, most guys kind of in the seventh grade, you kind of know where you're gonna be. I had premonition, uh, pr- predictions, other people's right. comments, coaches' comments. I knew in the seventh grade, Mr. Chen, he was a ch- Chinese teacher uh, in junior high, Vanguard Junior High. He used to come to me and his, Mr. Meacham, and they would talk. And they go, son, you're the second fastest guy in the school. You're going to be a hell of a track star or a hell of a baseball player or a hell of a football player. I'm going, how can you guys tell that already? We just know. You Don't let anybody put you down because you're little and short and all that stuff. Don't let them get in your head. You are better than the 6'4 guy that we have on the team and the 6'5 guy we got on the team. So don't let that ever bother you. And I listened to those two guys. These are lifetime teachers in our in our school district. So I, I put that, and I took the positive ammo, and I used it. So I, I listened to adults fuel me while other people may bring you down. You let 
those mentors mentor you. I have some great teachers around me. Uh, I, I had, Lenny, did, I had you, a, did you ever turn anybody around um, politically, let's just say politically, where some guy was just a racist when you met him and uh, a hateful person, let's just say that without using any expletives, um, and all of a sudden you had a lifetime connect with him and you, and you, you turned him around. It yeah, could be, I, I, <laughs> could be a woman. I mean, a person that um, just that comes to mind that um, your relationship um, flourished, even though it got off to let's say a rocky start. I see. I, I, I was kind of blessed because I had six ministers in my family. When I went to Arizona State, I had about ten teammates that didn't like me. And, and they don't know why they didn't like me. It just didn't, maybe the color of my skin, maybe because I like Stevie Wonder, Sly and the Family Stone, whatever. Because I had bell bottoms, I don't know why they didn't like me. And and I and I they, I had to turn them around because I heard the N word every day. I was the only African American on the team, so it wasn't like you know I lived the Jackie Robinson thing. I was Jackie in college. I was forty two, so I knew what that was like. I didn't have to see the movie. <laughs> I lived it. Uh-huh. So those guys, I would go, okay, John and. Ralph and whatever. I knew all their names. I knew their issues. And I, got, and I, I said, guys, uh, let's just try to win. Cause I, you know, I came from a captain environment. I was a captain, a co-captain of the team in high school in football, baseball. And, and I always took that leadership role of, I'm not going to be a, a follower. Okay. I'll be, I'll try to be a leader or a co-lead. I need three, four guys that think like me and we can win. I need three or four or five guys and, you know, you guys want to win this thing? You want to go to Omaha? I swear, we all all supposed to be about going to Omaha. I thought. So I said, if we go to Omaha, it's because we go we're going to the World Series, and they don't care what color you are. You know, you still in first, second, third, and home. They don't care. They they lost. I mean, if Chris Shamlin's going to be at first base, and we got to play him, we're going to take him out. We're going to take him out of the game. Because these guys, were, they're our competitors. You know, he went to UCLA. He's a great first baseman. He was hitting home runs. I said, you go after the other team's strength. And then those guys that were racist to me go, Lenny, you're right. Wow, if we can get this guy out, then we can, you know. I said, I, I'm studying each team. I'm studying their weaknesses, guys. Maybe you guys don't see this, but I learned from Marty Wills and Tommy Lasorda and Don Drysdale and Abby Pilsen how to take out the best players, you know, how to get them out. Basically, right. and they would go. Lenny, it wow! Lenny, I said, if you didn't have the instance with Frank Lucchesi, and we talked about this when you and I first met, I, I wasn't able not to add, to broach the subject and still have respect for what I do, uh, self-respect. And um, if the Lucchesi instance didn't take place, do you think you might have been a major league manager? Do I think I would have been a major league manager? Yeah. Did you have a disposition for it? Did you? Uh, um... No, no. Well, well my, my, my thing is not the people thing. I always wanted to be an owner. I never thought about managing. See, listen, uh, humbly, humbly. I had a mom and dad that had their own business. My mom and dad had their own business. They bought homes, properties. So they were the boss of their property. They were the landlord. They didn't buy it with your money that you earned. They bought it. No, they they did it. I wasn't even born yet. They had properties right. before that's I was right. born. That's what I mean. Yeah. They, yeah. they did it on their own. My dad, mom, she worked for a Katani lingerie clothing line in the, in the fashion industry, and he was a longshoreman at Long Beach uh, Sea at, at the ocean. He was a boiler maker where – a lot of guys don't like going down in a hole to fix a boiler, and you can't see, but with a flashlight. That's that's a that's a very hard job to replace somebody doing. He had a special right. gift, craft. My mom had a special craft. So with their funds, they would buy properties in L.A. and Long Beach. They would buy two and three homes and rent them out, they, or get them for. He was a military guy, so he got homes for a dollar or two dollars because they had a GI bill, and the GI bill was into making uh, guys that served in the military. Help America help them. So America helped those veterans by giving them homes at a lower rate at a cheap price or, or, or a dollar because they saved the country. That was in the air, air. Yeah, I Remember that was GI Bill. I, I'm an Air Force veteran, and I, I understand um, the, the concept and um, how that helped really get um, 
America going, the GI Bill did. People don't realize yeah. that. It was a trickling effect. All guys like you, Ralph, that had that trickling, went to war, you went to Korea, you went to Japan, you went to, to well, Italy. Well, I went to and Travis Air Force Base in, in California. It was kind of a difference. But I, I was still uh, a veteran. It was, you're um, contributing. You're a veteran. Yeah. You're much respected. So some of the veterans that I met through my dad and all my uncles are veterans, and all these guys are buying homes. And I went, wow. And they were making it you know, like, Fifteen hundred to two grand a month from property returns, you know, six grand a month, eight you grand a month. Your parents probably taught you that your athletic athleticism was a vehicle for uh, for this. Um, totally, totally, and that, that's that's the plane I was on. So when you talk about what made me think about, I didn't think about managing. I think about ownership. I've always thought about ownership. Not where, where if you're, if you're like your show, if you're on any show or who's ever running a business, you want good people around you in your business. You don't want to come off like an arrogant butthole boss. You want to come out as a contributor to helping them get wealthy or help them get better or help them help themselves, help their families. If you have, you know, Hank, Hank Greenberg didn't have to tell us how to buy stock. He could have just said, you know, I had time for these guys. You know, they don't care. But he was a, a neglected soldier who was also a veteran who also was very successful financially and spiritually and and giving and he never felt like he got his due as a player so he took his mentality as you know i don't want to be a manager i I want to be an owner he wanted to be an owner as well and he had us thinking about guys if you own a team then you run the team and you can have the team do as you say and then you'll win you're a winner winner you know winner winner you know and we went wow Hank himself became the general manager of Cleveland, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And yeah. died early. I don't. He was in his fifties, if I, if um, I'm not mistaken. He died. Yeah, he early. died too young. Way, way too young. Yeah. Steve and I, we used to just go over the how much knowledge he had. I mean, Ted Williams was our manager, and they were buddies, and they played against each other. Now you got a guy who's managing his son. I mean, that was hard on Ted to be managing Hank's kid at first base with Mike Epstein, you know. And here, here you got Epstein and Greenberg battling for first base. Who are you going to go with? And then you got Dick Nan, who's just as good as all of them, Don Mincher, and it wasn't a buddy thing. And Hank was like, you going to play my son or what? <laughs> it's, it's that's yeah, tough yeah, on the guys. It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah, war better than Coincidentally, Dan Epstein was nicknamed Super Jew when he, when he was out um, in Oakland. He played on the first uh, of three championship teams um, yeah. in Oakland, and I think he must have been in '72 when he played yeah. played for the A's. Um, wow! What Great teammate. Great teammate. I'm champion. writing about. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, he was a great teammate. Well, he, okay. Okay, and this is with Washington, am I correct? Washington Centers, yeah, he was he was phenomenal. He, uh, we, we, I mean, he's built like Superman. Him and Kirk Gibson had that that swagger, you know, that that build like a, a linebacker playing baseball. <laughs> you know, these guys were. Okay, uh, now you're in Washington. It's your first big league team, and Washington. Although it's a borderline south, you know, borders the south, still, a, still um, the north in some ways. All of a sudden, the team moves to Texas. Obviously, the players aren't in on that decision back in the days before free agency. So you couldn't control your destiny at that point where you wanted to play. Whoa, 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 whoa. Back up, buddy. Back it up now. I had Kurt. I, you remember Kurt Flood? Yes, very well. Kurt Flood was my teammate with the Senators, and he was battling that issue. He's the first free agent that said, look, I'm writing about that. Kurt Flood was also an artist, a painter. He goes, listen, if I don't make it in baseball, I'm going to go to Europe and Spain and become an artist because I don't like the fact that the Cardinals sent me to Washington, D.C., and it's not against you, Ted. It's nothing against uh, you personally, but I don't want to be a cow. I don't want to be like a piece of property, a cattle. So I'm not going to Texas, and I'm not going to Washington. 
I'm going to quit. Me and Denny McLean are going to quit. And Denny McLean goes, I'm not quitting. You might be quitting, but I'm not quitting. Denny McLean stayed. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, are you still in touch with Denny McLean? I have his number, and I've, ha- I've tried to get him as a guest many times. Denny is married to um, Lou B- Boudreaux's daughter. Daughter. Yeah. Yeah, no. And, I saw uh, Denny last year. Yeah, go ahead. Well, let's try to get him as a as a as a guest. Um, he's been um, his wife's been fighting some some illness, and he's got um, he's got things on his mind. But uh, what an interesting guy, life that he's led. Oh, uh, wonderful! Great pianist, great motivator. He was just an independent thinker, free free thinker. You know, the guy had his own plane. He had a helicopter landing in center field. While we were heading batting practice, the guy was unusual. He was funny, and at night he'd be on the piano playing at the top, you know, Pat O'Brien's or or Lindell's in Detroit. Any club he wanted to go to in America, he could go there, and play the piano like uh, I don't know. Uh, you, you remember how funny the Dino and Martin the Rat Pack was back back then? Oh yeah. Well, he he had his own little Rat Pack. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All uh, right. He he had some problems um, law wise after his career. He had had some mix ups um, as things go. Um, well, the, but, the thing was, Ted Williams was trying to help him win thirty games again. That's when he got traded from Detroit, and he wasn't really respectful of Ted's knowledge of pitching because Ted was telling him. I can make you a 31 or 40 game winner if you listen to me because I see all your pitches. I know what you're throwing before you even throw it. I can tell what you're doing because I steal your grip. I'm a student of the game. I study and own pitchers. If you listen to me, Denny, I can make you a 31 game winner again. And Denny didn't really listen to Ted. Ted even challenged him and said, look, I'm going to take batting practice off you and you can see if you can get me out and I'm going to hit you with my D-I-C-K. And I'm gonna leave my jacket on. <laughs> um, I can tell you, Denny was short, and Mike course. Epstein was in that bet. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is new because, uh, to me, as a, as a fan, because Ted's reputation as a manager from a um, is that of someone who helped hitters and really ignored pitchers. And you're telling me that he tried to work w- with McLean, which may. Obviously, he was working with other pitchers as well. That um, nice he was time. working with Dick. He was working with Dick Bosman. He was working with uh, Jim Merritt. He was working with Paul Lindbad. He was racing with Casey Cox. He had Paul Casanova as his catcher and Kenny Suarez and Dick Billings. And these guys, he was saying, "Listen, guys, if you listen to me, you know, because I really don't need this job. I'm just trying to do this because of the young guys coming in, the Joe Lavizos and, and the." And the and the Jeff Burroughs guys, I mean, Lenny coming in, and Dave Nelson. We were just breaking in, and Elliot. These were guys just coming in. That was enthusiastic for him. And Pete Broberg, he said, I'm going to make him my number one pitcher because Pete listens to me. He said, the young guys listen to me, the veterans don't, and that's my problem. And, I, and I'm only doing this this year because of rookies. You rookie guys coming in, I love the young spirit. I love the enthusiasm, and I'm going to stay around as long as you guys are around. Because I'm making more money at Sears and Roebuck than I am doing this crap. <laughs> right. He was the America's fisherman. He he made more. Hundred thousand dollars a year job. Hundred thousand right. more than baseball was paying him. And he said, "I'm freaking out." Not a bad salary. I don't care any time of the year. Sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties. Today, hundred thousand is a hundred thousand. I don't care. It's good money. Lenny, we're both on Facebook, and one of our mutual Facebook friends asked you a question about the late Paul Casanova. It was his birthday okay. recently, and um, you obviously, your answer, you obviously had a great deal of respect for him. Oh, so my God. Paul Casanova, if you will. Paul Casanova was like a, a, a Latin owner for South American baseball, and he was also a great spirit in the clubhouse. I mean, he introduced us to salsa, moringa, and cha-cha music and he had us livid i mean just lividly joyful uh vivacious i mean we had uh so much spirit because of his music and we go and he wasn't even a dj he just knew music and he knew how to get the right music for the right moment for the right time in the clubhouse 
And this is when boom boxes were just kind of coming out, like, you know, big, big time. So everybody goes, we got to turn our country music down. We got to turn our rock and roll, our pop, and whatever else we're playing. And we got to listen to this because this is like Sergio Mendez. This is like, uh, uh, you know, uh, foreign music that, that's hitting up. It makes you want to wake up, make you want to hit, make you want to steal a bass. And Paul had that that gift to know what worked in our clubhouse. And then he'd switch around and, and play a little bit of, uh, you know, some Smokey Robinson or some, some Gladys Knight or some, when it had a Latin flavor to it, whenever he, you know, wore no rider. I mean, he did things that that he was a leader, a quiet leader. And 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 every time there, and every time there was a fight, he he go look, you know, man, I I I know I know want to break up a fight, but I six five, I two forty, I you know, I I don't want to hurt anybody. I want to break a fight. I do not want to be deported. <laughs> <laughs> He does not want to be deported. Hold that thought. Yeah. We all don't want to be deported. That, that's a sense of survival. Uh, that should, has nothing to do with baseball. He just happened nothing. to be playing baseball. His number one thought, I do not want to be deported. <laughs> that's a big thing. You know, we, you know, we go to his country, you know, and, and, and play ball. He had a club called the La Palota. Is this just so Dominic, he, was he Dominican? No, 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 no. He was. He Paul was in Venezuela. See, Paul could go to oh. Venezuela. He could go. He could go to any Latin country he wanted to. He could go to Venezuela. Card block. He was card block in Venezuela. He could go to Puerto Rico. He get card block in Puerto Rico. Paul Casanova had it. I mean, come on, Casanova. And and name with Casanova in it is loving, right? I mean, it's like right. he's oh, the man. Absolutely. So, so he opened up. You're near to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so his club in Venezuela was the Palota, the baseball clubhouse. So post game, the whole team, every league player, you know, from Don Baylor, everybody, uh, we all went there because he had the most beautiful women, food, atmosphere, music. It was a, it was like uh, American bandstand of, of of Latin America, basically. It was American bandstand of Latin America, and and that, I mean, post game the food was reasonable, the atmosphere was reasonable, and and no owner got mad at him because he had a one o'clock last call curfew. I mean, some Latin clubs they don't know about curfew. <laughs> Paul go, you know, I I gotta be th- I gotta be thankful for my team for my team because I, we gotta get our rest, man. We gonna win tomorrow. We gotta get our rest, man. So last call. Pina Calada on me, last call. I mean, come on. <laughs> Who won't get the last? You get your last drink, you get your last dance, your last groove on, because he's thinking about tomorrow's win. How could you not like a guy? But half of the team's going, no, please, Paul. We'll bust curfew. We'll get fined. It's worth staying. We don't care. Pick, you know, he was going, no, no, I work for my team. On and off the field. You know, you this is just to, to relax. You relax, you have fun, then you win. Now let's go kick butt tomorrow, man. Whoop, music's gone. <laughs> he was an amazing guy. And then most, most guys that own clubs, you stay up at 4 a.m., 3 a.m., and you go to Denny's in the morning. Or, you know, you don't sleep. But he was conscious of his, his presence as a leader. That was phenomenal. I mean, we used to carry guys out there. Were you multilingual before all, all along? Because obviously you lived in Italy later on in your life. Language is important. How did you communicate? Was it initially Spanish when you went to Italy? Um, that's like 11 questions. My, my, my mom was around a lot of Italians because we were in the fashion industry. She was a, a salesperson and made shirts and clothes and shoes and, and uh, the whole fashion thing. That was her thing. She had fashion shows. I was around a lot of Italian designers. We had shows in, in – uh, San Francisco, San Mateo, San Diego. We traveled, went to Mexico. We got on boats and went on boat tour, you know, conferences. So, right. you know, we got on yachts. So we were around that fashion industry, entertainment. Katani Entertainment was a, a national line of, of lingerie and clothing. 
And there's no guy I know of that didn't want their wives wearing lingerie. So we saw a lot of models that were uh, Hebrew, Italian, Spanish. We went to Mexico and uh, in, in Encina, Ensenada, and Puerto and Alcapulco, and uh, Mazatlan, and Merida, and Campeche. We went to those towns, and we learned to speak Spanish through college, through uh, high school, because half of our school was Hispanic. So the Hispanic teachers and students and in our, in our area, Captain Centennial, California, Long Beach, L.A., were bilingual, you know, and then we learned another language, Italian. So we were trilingual from 15 up to maybe 21, depending on who you hung around or what part of the industry we were. We were just one big happy unit of, of family and fashion, basically. And we loved partying and eating and clothes. <laughs> who doesn't like not eat, who who doesn't like eating, fashion, clothes, and music? <laughs> okay. Lenny, I came across a picture the other day that um, really made me laugh. The um, Your meeting with Nixon in the clubhouse oh must, have been, must have been in Washington. You're giving him the peace sign, and it's almost like you have the two fingers up. It's almost like, remember when we were kids, you used to... Take a picture. You put your fingers up be, behind your friend's uh, friend's head. It looks like you know the peace sign to Nixon, well, and he's got a, well, he's got a smile on his face, and he wasn't really known as um, as someone who uh, took uh, minorities seriously. <laughs> Let's put it put it that way. I'm I'm kind today. Um, well, you are being kind. Let me let me put it to you like this. In the sports world, there's no politics while we're playing. In the sports world, Richard Nixon was in D.C. with me and Ted and our whole senator team, and he used to like for us to spit tobacco on his shoes. He just wanted to be one of the guys. He wanted to take batting practice. He wanted to now analyze the, the, the rotation. He and Ted were tight. Later on, I, I would always see him every other day in the clubhouse. So he was from Whittier. I was from California. We had a California connection. And he loved baseball. Loved Ronald Reagan liked baseball. I knew all 12 presidents personally. It was, you know, phone number, call me when you get home and do what you're doing all season, that kind of stuff. So I said, I said this. I said, look, I'm going to call you Disco Dick. You, cause you can dance. I saw you dance behind the cage. The music's going with the batting cage. You were shaking your little bum bum. I saw you doing, trying to, so I got a new dance called the Disco Dick. I'm gonna do you. I have a mask. I have a, I have your whole face on an album cover that I'm getting ready to do. I'm gonna release a song. And I hope you don't disprove of it if I do Disco Dick. Cause I'm gonna do your dance that I saw in the batting cage. And he goes, Lenny, I, let, let's make this perfectly clear. Perfect. Perfectly clear. You're my buddy. I've known you for 12 years. I don't give a rat's ass what you do. You're okay with me. You're okay by me. Now, George Argerus and, and Danny Kay may not like it, but I just love it. I just keep my name out there and don't miss a step because make sure you get that wiggle. Get that wiggle. <laughs> so, so I actually had a show when I did this. So did. Eisenhower's, Eisenhower's kid, David Eisenhower, <laughs> and he was um, Nixon's son-in-law, they were big baseball aficionados. Yeah. They would make he was our official score. Do you hear me, Ralph? He was our official score every game when he showed up. Really? you hear me? Yeah, he would walk in. The, okay, let me give you an example. Toby Harrell had a hit, hit off Brinkman's glove. And if he hit off Brinkman's glove, which is a golden glover, that had to be a hit because it hit off a glove. And he might write, write it down in the air. So he'd come down to the clubhouse and he'd go, Toby or whoever, you go, look, look, that was a hit. The ball, he's a golden glover. The ball hit off his glove. He goes, well, let me, let me think about it. Lenny, what do you think? What do you, hey, listen, he's a golden glover. You know, he'd ask for other people's opinion. I go, well, I think it was a hit because, I mean, Aurelio Regas had one like that and you gave him a hit. So what's the difference between Aurelio and, and Brinkman? You know, they're both golden glovers. I mean, if it was Belanger, would you give him a hit? You know, yeah, that, that, that's an interesting, okay, Toby, I'll change it. <laughs> <laughs> he can change it and make it a hit. He goes, you know, you mess with my baby's shoes. I, that shoes, may I get a raise. That one more hit, I could get yeah. five grand. <laughs> he had a sense of humor about it. It wasn't like he was a, 
a jerk or anything. He was he was cool with baseball people. He, he's a different person. I, you remember Rich Little? You remember Rich Little? Of course, yes. The impression. Okay. I met Rich Little, and I said to Rich Little, and I, and I could show you footage of it. And I said, Rich, I'm doing disco dick because I hung around comedians all my whole life because they always had a great look at life. They looked at life not like everybody else. So he goes, Lenny, I like that disco dick thing. I Can I steal it from you? I go, you asking me? You know you're going to steal it anyway. But, so he, goes, <laughs> he, goes, he goes, but where did you get the mask? Oh, I got them. You know, I have a private place in Chicago and another place in Seattle and another place in New York where I can get uh, masks and equipment that look like politicians or have them made up or actors or whoever, you know. Right. He goes, he thought, he goes, well, get me a dick, a disco dick. <laughs> A disco dick mask. I got him a disco dick mask, and it changed his career, and he moved to Vegas and started doing it. I don't know if you ever saw it, but wow. but the difference is I danced, and he didn't because he couldn't dance. But but he, he could do a couple breakdance moves. That was it. Well, as I was doing the worm on the floor, doing the, the spins on the ground and stuff like that. But, but – yeah, that, that that's a historical mask, the disco dick mask. You probably never saw it. Have you ever seen it? No, I don't remember it. Let's put it that way. Okay. Well, all right, I'll I'll post it so you can see it, you guys. <laughs> okay, good deal. Post it right on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network website on Facebook. Um, this is terrific. I love doing this with you, Lenny. We'll do it again tomorrow. If you can get Troy Percival, that would be great. Boy, that would um, – yeah. speaking of Palm Springs, that's exactly where the the, conf- the conversion was made between Troy and um, being a catcher and Troy being a pitcher and uh, Howie Gertzberg. Howie, I want to – or Lenny, I want to tell you about Howie. Howie was the pitching coach at St. John's back in the day when Frank Viola pitched against um, Ron Darling with Yale. And um, so he got um, he was um, got his spurs, so to speak, there. He became a uh, minor league pitching coach with the Angels, and he was the, the guru in that organization in the um, late 80s, early 90s. A um, lot of guys came th- came through there, um, came through Palm Springs where you are now. And what I remember about Palm Springs, it got so hot, they had, I don't know if they're still there in the stadium, they had the little misters where, um, I don't, don't know if you remember that in the real heat of, of Palm Springs. Yeah. But, well, Tom uh, Frank was the Angels' uh, main spring training site. It was one that uh, used to be their their AAA uh, and uh, A ball home right. for all their uh, uh, rehab players as well. Yeah, Angels, that was their home. Yeah, um, you never played with the Angels. I was with the Angels for for about thirty days to two two months, and uh, Rod Carew was my coach then, and Sam Saplizio, and that's how I met Joe Madden. Joe Madden and I used to hang out when he was a coach uh, for the Angels with uh, oh. Latchman. Latchman was his uh, the manager, and uh, they called me to come out and try uh, out for, for being an Angel. I had the fortune to have uh, Tim Mead. As a 12 years old, I've known Tim Mead. He's a vice president of the Angels, and he wanted me to leave Italy. Leave, There's a farm leave director. Italy. Farm director, yeah, and communications as well. And he said, instead of going back to Italy, come out and do the Angels and try to make uh, make the club as a utility or or a third or an outfielder. And uh, he talked me into coming back uh, to be an Angel. And and then the, the Italy found out about it. Well, we'll make sure the offer you can't refuse. You better come back to Italy because I still had a contract in Italy. And uh, the, the Angels spring training event was phenomenal. It was right during the uh, the uh, Michael Jordan. For the love of the game, time he came out of ball uh, basketball and and went into uh, to uh, baseball. And as an angel, I'm in the field as a Sun Devil angel. I, that, there were like ten thousand fans from Arizona State that came out for the Angels. 
And they were like, Lenny, the hell with baseball. Go back to football. <laughs> <laughs> you ever wonder about what would have been if you went to football? I should have listened to those 10,000 people who were telling me to go back to football. With a, no, not I, you back know, it, to football, it, it, but come up, with, come up in football. I, 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 I had the, 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 uh, the privilege of watching off-season results of football players every season. From 18 to 23, I saw uh, Larry Walton with a bad leg or a bad knee or a bad head or a bad back. I saw Danny White's fingers broken. I saw people, uh, uh, Lonnie Lott, no finger <laughs> at all. And they were going, no, nah, man, you better stop playing again. <laughs> Right. He goes, I think, I wish, they kept telling me, I wish I was a baseball player. I wish I was, <laughs> then I started thinking about it. Bob Brunick, knee, meniscus, uh, you know, Achilles, and all these injuries they were having. And these are like two and three years in the, in the system, you know. Four and five years, all of a sudden, they got uh, dislocated back, and they got concussions. And, and I go, I'm not stupid, but should I go play football again? And Kush goes, look. You got to make that decision yourself, but I would love to have you on, on the Colts work that time when he was getting Elway to come back to be a wide receiver, punt return, kickoff. It was tempting. It was very tempting because uh, I still, you know, in, in the back of your mind, you all have a wish. Everybody does in America. If there were four things you could do and you've done all four of them, but one of them you didn't get to do, you go, wow. I'd like yeah, to be. You're always thinking about what you didn't do as opposed to what you did do. That's. Uh... That's discontent, or call it what you want. Um, grass is greener, that kind of thing. But you can't. You got to make a decision and go with it, and not look back, or else you. But I, I, I would listen to guys like Kevin Costner, and he goes, "God, I wish I was a big leaguer." I go, "Well, if you come to our camp, give me five or ten grand, and you can pitch, and then we'll treat you like a big leaguer." <laughs> 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 it's your fantasy, fantasy camp. Come on, and that's how he and loves. How many fans? You've done over the years. You've got three or four um, teams that you played with, and they all all have uh, some sort of program. Would you estimate how many how many fantasy camps that you went to? Over a hundred. But Ralph, I'm not baseball American oriented. I'm Canada, Japan, Italy. You know, I'll take fifteen, ten, eleven guys and go do one in in uh, Mito, Japan. I'll take ten, eleven, fifteen, uh, nine guys and go to. Sicily or go to Rome or go to Germany or Naples. I, I, I don't even count the American guys, <laughs> the American teams. <laughs> I'm beyond the American thing. But, so it's it's a, a lot, a lot. I mean, I, I get a call every day from Felix Neon and Fergie Jenkins going, where are we going back? <laughs> well, I'm where are we going back to Italy? Don't yeah, so. Public relations, public um <laughs> don't they need an announcer? Like, oh, having, no, you're in the loop. Don't your fantasy teams need need a? I can't even think of the word. Um, a broadcaster, a narrator. A public, right, a narrator. Don't they need you, boy, to come over there and eat pasta and sleep till noon and then talk for a few minutes. Now, about in number thirty-four, <laughs> Lenny. I Randall, number 30. As, as we speak, Ralph, I talked to Joe Madden. He wants to come for a week or two days, and he wants a month all by himself. I talked to Rizzo, Anthony Rizzo. He wants to come and do it. Joe, he goes, if Joe goes, I go. So I've all talked right. to – there's 11 guys that, that we've invited to come over this offseason, including Ed Cranepool, John Stern, and Randy Jones. Randy Jones, and close folks don't know this, had, had cancer. And his dream before he dies is to go over to Italy, pitch or do a clinic with me and a couple of guys, about 10 of us. And we're going to go do that either in December or February. We have it in the books already. And we're going to take guys. So, Ralph, you'll be our broadcaster guy, along with Eric and five other guys that are driving me nuts to go over for a $700 round trip. Okay? How cheap is that? <laughs> hey, by the way, Eric is recovering from, from uh, a bout of it. Uh, our friend Eric, Eric Lindbergh. Um, let's wish him good luck. I'm shocked about Randy Jones. Is he? Is it under control or? Um, well, he 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 said it is, but he doesn't come off like he wants any pity because he's you know a lot of pride, a lot of lot of lot of uh, 
you know, a lot of, you know, he does, he wants to be a helper more so than a pity person. He's like, he doesn't want pity. So he, he says, I'm going to continue to do my, my military softball games I'm continue, until I have no strength. I'm going to do the, I'll die on the mound. Basically, he says, I'll pitch and die on the mound. Softball, baseball, I'm going to. Now, I said, Randy, you don't have to do anything with me. Just put your feet in the water and point. Just, yeah, just be there. That's... Just be there. That's it. <laughs> so a lot of guys feel like they have to do something. I'm trying to tell them, no, this is our last hooray. We do it our way. No work. Just play. And uh, thank God and the Pope. Right. And next time we're, we have to talk about uh, the Peter Golenbach book, how you met Peter. Um Great book, the for what was it called, the Forever Boys or um, the Forever Boys? Yeah, yeah. The Forever yeah. Boys, for- and that was that was a league you guys put together, a senior league in Florida, and it was, I think, um, it was Peter's greatest book. I mean, it, it, he had the the subjects to write it, and um, I remember reading that book in in the. 80s uh, in the library and thinking, boy, I would love to have the opportunity to talk to some of the players that played in that league. And sure enough, we're talking 15 years later, I get to talk to a bunch of them, including Peter Golenbach on a regular basis, whose show you were not on last night for one reason or another, and we had to talk about you behind your back. Um, So... I, I had a cousin that died. I might as well share this with you. And uh, his funeral, is, is, as we speak, yeah, George was a military veteran. He was uh, Vietnam, and uh, he had a heart. Well, you know, just heart was hurting. Uh, no, no air, no wind, couldn't breathe. So he just went a routine check to the hospital, and he thought it was just, uh, you know, gas. And uh, he died. He just heart collapsed, and we were in shock. No, the whole family's in shock. We can't believe it. He was 66. He was the same age. And uh, he, we just can't believe that you, God could just take you out like that over bad food, bad dinner, gas, no signs, no symptoms. And he left two kids behind, and uh, now we got to figure out how to bury him this week uh, as we speak, Wednesday and Thursday. I'll be kind of occupied with that. So, folks, I couldn't make it last night. I uh, just to your family, Lenny. What was his name? So you can pay him some homage. George, George Bennett was a, a patriot of America, a soldier, a uh, Vietnam veteran. George Bennett was a Compton High phenomenon as far as track goes, a distance runner. And he was a great father. And he was, he ran a, his own, uh, a liquor store. He had a, his own, uh, beverage, uh, store. He had not a, not a lot of stress at home. He, he had more in Vietnam than he did in the streets. That's why we couldn't believe, uh, you know, everybody liked him. We, you know, he did a lot of things for a lot of people. He even did, mercy, you know, taking food to seniors. They had a dollar hide center in California. He used to take all seniors, their, their meals on wheels, you know, 15, 13 people. They'll pick up the groceries, put it on their porch if they didn't answer the door or too old to get to the door or take it in the door. And some of the seniors would leave the kid and the man and say, George, Bring it on in, George. And he just was that kind of guy. We, he was a workaholic, workaholic, just a, a phenomenal person who, you know, America will never know. Is too, 66 is too damn young. Yeah, yep. Yeah. George Bennett, man, survived by brother Emmett Bennett, who's going through some things, another war veteran thing. I'm thinking a lot of the Vietnam guys now are getting a lot of symptoms from whatever was going on in that war. Uh, it may oh, be, yeah. I don't know, if it's asbestos yes. or something. Something. Yes. Something's going on. Yeah, so I pray, I pray for all you vets out there. Okay. Um, good way to end it by paying homage to, to a well-deserving veteran. Um, Thank you. We'll Thank you, George, love. for all your service. Thank you, George. Yes. Did it. All right, Lenny. Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, Lenny Randall's Hot Corner. I'm Ralph Tycho, and um, Lenny will be back um, during the week. We'll chat again and um, keep it going. How about that? Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, too, Lenny. Be well. And, uh, again, my condolences to your entire family. Hugs and uh, peace and love.
That's it. All right. Adios, everybody. Adios. We are back. The comfortably zoned newest show, Lenny Randall's Hot Corner. I'm Ralph Tycho, and Lenny is here with a very, very special guest. How are you? Well, special for for five reasons. Troy, first of all, folks, Angel, and a hardworking coach at Riverside University, uh, University of Riverside, California. It's, It's awesome school. An awesome personality doing lots of awesome things for. I, I witnessed, I think about 50 kids the other day at practice who are trying to get scholarships, trying to get in the league, trying to get their degrees, and trying to better their lives. And they couldn't have a better rep than former angel slash catcher slash pitcher slash coach and carpenter. He's a carpenter. He builds houses. <laughs> he leaves tall buildings with a single bound. Yeah, he actually built their their help build their complex, their clubhouse. Troy, you might want to talk about that a little bit because I didn't know you had those. Uh, uh, I don't know Van Gogh and Cecil B. the Mill built type, you know, architecture. I can't take a lot of credit for the hammering and the and the nails, but uh, I I did have my uh, father-in-law at the time uh, help me build them, and then I did help install them. And uh, we've got a really nice clubhouse here. I'm just was back. Geez, when I, I was still playing baseball back in those days, and it's, it's still held up, and we still have one of the nicer clubhouses uh, in our conference. Nice. It's nice. a recruiting tool, Ralph, to get kids to come to that college, which is a great program they have. You guys won it. Didn't you guys go to playoffs in uh, Fullerton a while back? Uh, I believe uh, 2007, uh, UC Riverside made the playoffs, won the conference, uh, but it's been kind of some slow down years since then, and that's my job to come in here and, and rebuild the program. And now coming into my fourth season, it, we've really got a lot of talent. we just got to bring it together. We've got a lot of new faces. Well, nice, nice that you're uh, passing on what you learned, uh, your experiences to kids and helping develop them. Who is uh, your number one success stories thus far? Well, it depends on if we go all the way back to my high school coaching days or here. We've, we've got some really good guys that have, have come out of our program in the last three years that I've been here. Um, Austin Sauters, had, I think he was 11-4 and four this year with the Detroit Tigers organization. Uh, Vince Fernandez had a 22-game hit streak uh, with the Colorado Rockies organization. And then uh, Ryan Lilly came out last year in the fifth round. Um, did a really nice job with the Miami organization. So we're, we're starting to pump out some pretty good prospects. I'm just trying to teach kids here at UC Riverside how to play at the next level as opposed to your typical college where it's, you know, win at all costs and we're not necessarily teaching what you need to know for the next level. So I, I think we're having some great success with that. Now it's, it's just got to translate into more wins than losses. How did you, how did you meet up with Lenny? Oh, well, I, I think this has been long ago. Okay. I, I, tell, me, tell me some stories. Tell me some stories. <laughs> well, I, I, you want me to start it off, Troy, or you want to start it off? This is podcast. No, you go on ahead. Okay. 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 Well, time, I was out with Tim Mead, and that Tim Mead, was I've known him since he was 12. And I was asking him, what guys should I bring out to the city uh, to sign autographs in the mall to – enlighten the fans and let them know their personalities and know their character. And he mentioned Troy and Adam Kennedy. And they were you know, they were World Series bound. They were very flamboyant to me because I thought, here's a guy that converted from a catcher to a pitcher. What more guys should do, because I think pitchers don't realize this, but catchers throw the best batting practice on the planet. <laughs> All catchers throw great BP. And then if they happen to have a 94, 95, or 99 mile hour fastball. That's a bonus. And then it's three, and they got a little attitude, like a little moxie, like they were, like McGregor, and they were to take somebody on. Then you don't want to get in the box. I said, well, let me have Troy, <laughs> and he'd come sign autographs so the fans can see another side of him. So he goes, you know, Troy's not expensive. I go, expensive? What do you mean, like fifteen hundred, three grand, a hundred thousand dollars? To come out of the house, what? What, is, what are we talking here? 
So the other day I had two players that are prospects come out to see Troy, and I, I just happened to find his checks that I, from 2000, was it 2002 or nine or something? And I said, you guys take this up to Troy, and I'm going to remind him of the last time we were together was 2002 or 12 through an autograph session at Angel Stadium, outside Angel Stadium. And he goes, he snapped those checks up so quick. <laughs> Ralph, one was 1500 and one was 1000 right? So I'm going to show them to you. And I was proud that he came it's out. All, to, it's all money. All it is is just an exchange of currency between friends. But let me tell you, the guy was giving away goodies. He was, okay. You remember the monkey, the little monkey, rally monkey? He was buying rally monkeys and giving them to the kids. And it was like we had a seventh inning stretch in the mall. <laughs> Not bad. Pretty fun. Yeah. You keep mentioning Tim Mead. If you guys, how much would you guys pay oh my God. for a, a, a Tim Mead Palm Springs Angel baseball card? <laughs> this, <laughs> priceless. Priceless, it is. right? Yeah. And was Pete, do you yeah. remember Pete Rickard being the general manager there when you were there? That's yeah. a little beyond my day. Well, oh, I remember yeah. the guy hitting the fungos, Pee Wee. Remember the guy that hit all the fungos, the old guy that hit the fungos? Pee Wee Re- Reese. I do. His yeah, name Reese, was Reese, yeah. and, and he was Babe Ruth's roommate at one time um, yeah. back in the day. He, never, he, had a cha- he was a Jewish yeah. guy who changed his name. His name was Solomon. Oh, and, uh, oh Solomon? To, play, to avoid racism or... Um, huh whatever it was back then and still is today. Um, I thought his name was too long to get on a card. That's why. <laughs> oh, no, no that, that wasn't it. But he was, you know, when you, he was into his 90s, still coaching with the oh, A's. And, yeah, he um, was amazing. He was. As um, I mentioned off the air to Troy that I was the guy who signed him to his his tops contract way back in the in the day, and that um, he was a catcher uh, initially when he came into organized ball, and um, Howie Gersberg, the late Howie Gersberg, who was a uh, pitching guru in the Angels organization, was Troy's first, and my close, close friend, um, was Troy's first pitching coach. What do you remember about Troy, you uh, remember, do you remember Cy Berger, Troy at all? Oh, I worked Cy. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Now, yeah. Cy Berger was my guy because I met him through Willie Mays. And Willie goes, goes, this is the guy. I didn't know what Willie was talking about at the time. He goes, this is the guy you want to know. And he was in a suit, three-piece, you know, with a tie, and he looked like a presidential candidate, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he goes, you want to sign with me? Because at that time, it was Don Russ coming in and uh, Upper Deck was coming in. It was some rival car companies. And he goes, right. I will take care of you for life. <laughs> when I heard for life, I went, oh, for life? Okay. Yeah. So what are you telling me? The other guys are a couple of days? Well, done? Was <laughs> it guy's life or your life? Well, everybody. Anybody around? Oh, come on, right. Troy. You know, Cy, Cy Berger was a straight shooter. He was, a, he was a class guy. Gave us great I bonuses on our yeah, on a card. I worked for him. And he always had a sense years. of humor. I worked known for, him him for 13 years. 13 years. He's a oh, ter- terrific yeah. guy. And basically put baseball cards on the map as we know them yeah. today. Chewing gum cards combined the two. Yeah. And uh, historic. Um, iconic. God, it just came out like a week ago. Have, have you heard, Troy? There's a new set of Topps cards with bubble gum again. We're doing bubble gum again in the car. Oh, all right. Maybe. Take it back to the old school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause see, I, I was, Ralph, while I was out on the field, he had a wad of something in his mouth. I don't know if it was tobacco or leaves or, palm, palm, you know, palm trees, juice or something in his mouth back in the day. I don't know if he still – do you still spit I, that stuff out? <laughs> more, more gum than more anything. Gum. <laughs> I can remember the gum from when I was a kid, and uh, more dentists yeah. got rich – because of that gum, <laughs> <laughs> they sent their their own kids to college. <laughs> yeah. Because of that, yeah. um, Tim, what's next? What's next? Troy's big move right now is to win the NCAA title. I'm gonna try to send some players to do it, and then I'm gonna take him to Italy. 
and they want to take him to Italy and a couple of players. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, Lenny, when you travel around, you get coaches um, for your clinics and what have you from the local area, or are there coaches that are contracted with you that go with you from place to place? We like to mix it up so that they can keep a report throughout the rest of their lives so they can Facebook or Twitter or Google or Instagram now because the social media has really changed communication. They don't need Lenny to, to hook them up anymore. Sometimes they can set up a trip and just do a vacation with their wife and kids and not work. But some kids want, and players and coaches like to go over, do a two- or three-day clinic, stay two weeks, and see the, you know, the Mediterranean Sea or, or travel or go to the Vatican or go to Prada, you know, go to the sites, the historical sites. So we do train kids, and then after that, the coach is able to do what they want. Some of the players, you know, the, I, I forgot to tell Troy this. It's only two days a week, Troy, and those two uh-huh. days a week during the summer is awesome because we only play May, June, July, August. The whole month of August is off, Troy. It's utopia. That's why I've been over there 31 years. <laughs> you don't age. <laughs> so you may have got all of them if you can't two or five grand or three grand a month, depending on the player and ability. And you basically just two days a week. Foods comped, rooms are comped, cars comped, clothes are comped. And you, you stay at a nice uh, five-star hotel or condo. There's no really no bill. Is that bill. all you got? Just, Is that all you got? <laughs> what more do you want? And I forgot. I'm sorry. Right. Troy will throw in a five course meal. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that'll do it. <laughs> that'll do it. So that's like a, a no brainer, Troy. You're over there. You get the shots and you travel, and um, that's that's terrific. Lenny, where did you? Which recruiter along the way, be it Kush or Winkles or any of those guys or um, scouts, where did you learn your technique for for recruit? Who's the best recruiter you ever had? Well, I had Bobby Winkles and Jack Smitherin, and, and Troy knows Jack Smitherin because he coached at UCR, and those guys were gamers. They were like, they just told you the truth. You know, some guys blow smoke at you, but, you know, we're going to do this for you, we're going to do that for you. you bottom line, you're going to live in a dorm, you're going to eat food, you're going to play hard, you're going to win, and you got to do your homework in order to stay eligible. And all those other perks aren't really because you want to get your degree. You really go there to get a degree. And those are not there for a degree first and then pro ball second, you know, because I've seen guys, Troy, you've probably seen it too, where during the winter, like right now, they just had their first session of practice at Arizona State. Guys signed by Christmas. They don't even end up playing in the spring. Right. It's that good well, program. You know, so we were around straight shooters. We've been, we've been doing this going on um, three weeks now, almost every day. And in every show, in every reference to to whatever it is that you're recruiting for, wh- whoever it is that you're recruiting, you always mention education first. Well, I mean, that, that, that education is first. And... Um, Boy, if I were a parent of a kid who was a prodigy along those lines, uh, I'd be signing up, Lenny. So. Well, Troy knows, you know, him and uh, Adam Kennedy, they went to North High and was the Reno Valley High, I believe. And that area in the Inland Empire, it's a hotbed for talent overlooked. A lot of those kids just get overlooked. So when you find a fit like somebody like Troy, or somebody like uh, Oregon, you know, different personalities fit different players. You know, to me, I'm Troy's a hard-nosed kind of guy who can get results because he's been there. Some of the coaches that are in, in that level, Division One or two, or they, they don't know anything about the big leagues. So Troy knows a lot about high school, a lot about college, and a lot about life after baseball. You know, it's life after baseball. <laughs> guys don't think that. They think at 23 they're going to play until they're 40. both you guys – whether or not what the not, ugh, I'm going to ask both of you guys what the major difference between amateur ball and pro ball your first adjustment to pro ball and you came from a big school Lenny it probably wasn't that much 
but uh, what were both of your your adjustments? Troy, go first. Go ahead. Well, the first adjustment for me going into pro ball was I, I didn't have to split my day between uh, academics and athletics. I got to focus on just baseball. Um, college players deserve a lot of respect because it, it is from 7 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night. Um, it, it is a tough schedule, and then all of a sudden you get to pro ball, and it's it's just baseball. I think as much as I learned in college, getting that opportunity to just focus on, on sports uh, made me a much better player, but I think the college life made me a much better man. You know, I learned how to um, divide my time, how, how to um, not waste time was probably the biggest thing because you just can't do it at the college level. If you're wasting time, you're falling behind. You know, that, time management is a difference. big issue. Time management is the greatest thing in college. You learn everything. If you, I and, wish you did and in the college. Idle time mind management. is the devil's tool too with some guys. Well, we were never bored in college. We always had a book or a ball no, in mean, front of us. I mean in the pros. The pro life is, is cake to me. It was like a break. It was like, you know, we had a lot of, you know, discipline, a lot of hard nose workouts, you know. with We were like a military team playing baseball, basically. We were like little Marines, a little, you know, Green Beret. The way our coaches trained, we had to run a lot. So, we didn't have any time off season, off time. If you did two sports, then you definitely had no time. I did two sports, I had no time but sports and books and ball, basically. So when I got to pro ball, it was cake to me. It was like, order. So what do we do between like seven and twelve? What? <laughs> what if we go to lunch? You think you wait to be late? You don't have a curfew, you know, getting up in the morning. You know, we had a, you know, Troy, you can attest to this. I love going to IHOP in the morning at ten, eleven o'clock, <laughs> or Denny's. Yeah, that's, that's, it's a big, it's a big adjustment, and you know that's part of what I do here at UC Riverside is is, is teaching these kids the difference between what you're going to encounter in college versus pro ball. You want to get to pro ball, so you got to endure the three years of tough schedules, tough schoolwork, uh, tough love, the whole deal, just so you can go and experience even if it's for one year, two years at the most, um, if you get that opportunity to go out and just play baseball, you really find your love for the game. And then, you know, I think that's where guys start to flourish, and, and then they move on to double-A, triple-A, and, and on beyond if they have the talent. But I think everybody should at least have the goal to go experience that. And in order to do that, you've got to put in a lot of hard work at the college level. Right. Yeah. Troy, Arizona State. Troy Lennon, I'm do you sorry, mind if I take if if I take a moment to try to get into try how many closers have I major league oh, wow. successful long term closers have I ever interviewed? This is terrific for me. So let me ask some questions along those lines. Do you think that the game itself, because of the division of innings, the setup man, the this, you know, the long man, the setup man, the closer, and all that. Do you think the game is better off, or would it be better for the game if the best reliever could come in at a situation that's most needed? Maybe the game is on the line in the sixth inning, and yeah, you know, the best I, I understand. I know, I know exactly you know where you're I'm going with this. Yeah, and and. The fact is, I think when you get to the postseason, you can think along the lines of I'm bringing my, my closer um, at any point during the game that is pivotal. Uh, during the during the, the regular season, you just can't do that. Guys need their roles, and the fact is not everybody can pitch in ninth inning. And, and I laugh when I hear people say it's just an inning. Anybody can do it. What's the difference? Well, you can you can go over – the history of baseball, how many setup guys, long guys that have been pushed into that role, and the percentage that actually had success in it. Um, the closer role is a difficult role. I mean, you're the field goal kicker on Monday night football. If you if you get the job done, nobody notices, but if you don't, the whole world knows. So it, it is a tougher role, and, and that's why I think during regular season play, you really have to have your defined roles. You need to have a closer. Um, you need to have one to two setup guys and a long guy. Uh, but, yeah, when the postseason comes, 
I, I think you've got to do whatever it is to get you inning by inning as far as you can get and then, you know, hope that your offense comes through and, and gets you a bigger cushion. You also have, in the postseason, you also have the advantage of some of your starters in the bullpen to back you up. Um, say they bring you in, the closer in in the sixth inning, that kind of thing. So it, it it's an easier decision. But um, – who, who developed in your – gave you the mindset that you could be that ninth-inning guy? What differentiated you from, uh, say – and I'm going to throw a name out there – Rick Reed, who um, is a New York Med, and I uh, follow – who was a New York Med, and um, he just was a terrific setup man, is, and just doesn't flourish in the closing role. What what was it about you that um, you know Cajonas? Uh, you, know, you know what was it? What, what made Troy Percival Troy Percival? Well, I tell you, I mean, it, it's not to take away from setup man. I, I think that's a very defined role, and and it's difficult in its own right. You you have to throw multiple innings more often than a closer does. Um, I think a lot no, of closers when are born when to the be setup closer. Setup man is put into that role, as you said, sometimes. Oftentimes they don't succeed. What, what what's the one or two characteristics about you? If you could look in, inside yourself, what made you succeed in the, in the toughest job? You know, arguably the toughest job in baseball. Of course, hitting a round ball with a round bat is pretty, is pretty skilled skilled thing too. Well, I think a lot. Everybody, it can go environmental. It can go. Hey, I was born with it, but. Truth be known, I was I was thrown into that situation as a young kid. My dad was my coach, and every single game it seemed like he brought me in with bases loaded, no outs, and a one-run game. So by the time I got to to the big leagues as a closer, even though I'd been catching, pressure didn't bother me. Uh, matter of fact, I believe my save percentage in one-run games was far better than it was in three-run games. At least it felt that way when I was on the mound, because I thrived on the pressure and knowing that the guy standing in the box was feeling more pressure than I was, whereas a three-run game, you know, there's not much pressure at the plate. You're just trying to get on base, make something happen, and and, and go from there. But I always thrived on on knowing I could handle pressure better than the guy that was at the plate. Um, and Bob, I, I, I had the amazing opportunity to have guys like Bruce Suter on my team with the Cubs and Goose Gossage on my Cub and Dick Tidro, and they're clone Troy Percival's. They're balls out, no fear. Let's go get them, guys. Get in the box. You're holding up the game. Mano y mano. I got to, you got to hit it. And it was that. I, I learned from listening and watching those guys. You know, you know, we had a little meetings on the mound, Troy. You remember the little third baseman would come over or the catcher would go, well, how do you, how are we going to get this guy out? And most of the relievers would go, gas, heat, let's go. <laughs> it wasn't like, yeah, I'm going to finesse him. Push him back or something. I got to let him out here. But, it, it was it was uh, that kind of era. Kromboski. I mean, I, I can name twenty guys that had the yeah, Troy Percival. It's a mentality, right? The, the, to me, it was the ability to say it's me against this guy, and you're not beating me, which kind of takes away the whole. There's base runners out there. There's fifty thousand people in the stands, and I can break it down to: there's a guy in the box that I have to beat, and I'm going to beat him. Yeah, I, I remember Lee Smith, uh, roommate Cubs. And, he, you know, this guy had a quarterback mentality, linebacker mentality. You know, certain guys, and I don't know if you played any football at all, but I looked at Troy as like a linebacker pitching. I looked at him like Howie Long on the mound. <laughs> yeah, and you, you look know? at a lot of them, a lot of the, the successful closers that are out there have that mentality. I mean, you got, obviously, Mariano Rivera was a very special and different closer yeah. in my book. You know, yeah. he wasn't that, you know, I'm – Fire yeah, into the wall. Here I go. He, he was, was charisma. Yeah, he was, he was methodical. Um, he was yeah. a machine. Uh, but in his own mind, you could see there was nothing breaking his focus when he was out there. A uh, very special human being uh, to watch the way he went about his business. But you know, for most of your closers, it is it's all or nothing. Here it comes. You know, I, I love watching Kimbrel throw. I've really started to enjoy watching Kenley Jansen throw. There's just an intensity within most of these closers that is it's just fun to watch. Guys, yeah, I used well, to watch Willie Hernandez. You guys remember him? Big league. Do you have aspirations of being a big league coach someday? 
or manager? Yeah, you know, I think I'd like to start it in the pitching end of it because I just I really enjoy teaching not only the mechanics but the mentality of pitching. I do love running a baseball game. So, yeah, I would say there is an aspiration to manage. Um, but I, I do also think that starting as a pitching coach at that level would be great. I just don't have a whole, whole lot of desire to start at A-ball all over again and work my way up. Right. I'm going to give you a little inside scoop, Ralph. You ready for this? News flash, okay. breaking news. Next coach, manager, California Angels. Oops, did I say Troy Percival? Oops, did I say that? Oops, did yeah. I let that leak? I'd have to get a phone call first. Uh, They could and have done a hell of a lot worse in the past. Well, well, they got a pretty good one right now that I played for and have a lot of respect for. Uh, Mr. Sosa. The the only reason why I say that is some guys might burn out. Like, for example, Panella burned out and came back. You know, you could burn out. Dusty burned out and came back. So Sosa might burn out and come back. That's what I'm I'm not saying I – he might get fired but, or whatever, but you know, with Dusty, if, if I don't that think happens, he burned out. I think that I think it's a matter. It's a a matter of if a team hears the same story for seven, eight years in a row, I think the team burns out more than the manager burns out, and um, that's just my guess. Um, does I hope Dusty wins it because of Dusty. Uh, <laughs> I got a chance to play for Dusty. He's, he's also another wonderful human being and, and truly cares about his players. And, you know, right. I don't think anybody ever roots against Dusty. No. Yeah. Uh, were you on yeah. the on the Angel team that uh, won it against Dusty? I'm, I was, and I had played for Dusty in the Arizona Fall League uh, before that. I already knew what kind of man he was, but it, it was okay. I was, I was good with Dusty losing that one. Uh, no, I one, sure. one ironic thing too, Ralph is Dusty's from the area that Troy is in. He's Mr. Riverside, and the, uh, and the Bonds family, yeah. and the Reggie Miller family. Dusty yeah, there's also quite has a... experience up in Sacramento too. He grew up in Riverside, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Um, so yeah, terrific. This is and, this has been great. Um, would you come back uh, time and time again and uh, keep us updated on what's going on, Troy? Absolutely, and in the meantime, just keep an eye on those UCR Highlanders, man. We're going to go get them. Beautiful. They got the Beautiful. Yeah. Lenny? Yeah. This no, is real, real quick cool. about the first baseman. Yes. Uh, uh, has an interesting name. Hans? Is it Hans something? What, Troy? What's that? The, fir- What's the that? first five, six, four first baseman. Heinz or Hansel or something like that. Your Are first you baseman. Over here where I'm at? Oh, yeah, I've got, I got uh, Connor Cannon will be a, a first baseman here. Then I've got a pitcher that you're probably talking about, Taza Hill Kahada. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a yeah, left-handed yeah. kid that'll go uh, 90 to 95 miles an hour. Uh, we're working on his command right now, but uh, you're looking at a kid that has the ability to to get all the way to the major leagues, and i just doing my best to to move that along. And that outfielder that 94, that you know, like about 6'3", outfielder that yeah. is, is the close. Eight, uh, AJ Sawyer, yeah, AJ Sawyer, we can, uh, yeah, we converted him to a part-time pitcher this year. He'll do a little bit more pitching. Uh, he'll go, he'll be as high as 95, and he'll be 92, 93 consistently. Uh, big, strong kid, and I think uh, if yeah. he ever turned to a pitcher only, you're, you're looking at a kid that's going to be 95 to 97. Okay, yeah. Yeah, hey Troy, right before I, uh, you know we close this out, I just got to ask you: the day you got called up, who told you? Oh, let's see. I got called into the office by Donnie Long and um, Lenny Cicada, another old name for you. Oh, Lenny yeah. Cicada, Lenny was base. a former Yankee, uh, probably yeah. Yeah. Uh, played yeah. with or against Lenny for Baltimore. Yeah. I'll I tell you another guy you had, Sam Sofrizio and Joe Madden, while you were there. Oh, yeah. Well. Joe, yeah, Joe was our them. roving guy, and, and Sam Sapluzio yeah. was just like one of the best human beings you could ever be around to oh my God, do anything for you, man. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I know he's involved in baseball out in Colorado. Colorado you know, he's got a yeah. field named out of him out there. So. Yeah, yeah. Great great group of circles of guys. I'm glad we can around. get those names on the air and give them some, uh, pay them some homage. Um, minor league coaches are unappreciated, 
underpaid and uh, overworked. How about that? That's fair. Sounds like a college coach. <laughs> well, I, I heard the raise went up from four cents an hour to eight cents an hour now, so well, that's about where we're at. <laughs> eight cents an hour, Ralph. <laughs> um, at least. <laughs> um, thank you, gentlemen. We'll do it tomorrow, Lenny. Yes, okay. and uh, stay well and be healthy. Peace and love, everybody. Adios. Oh, Highlanders. Thank All you. Right. Adios. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. We are back. Lenny Randall's Hot Corner. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and I play George Fenneman to Lenny's Groucho. Good morning, sir. Buongiorno. Everybody say good morning, Ralph Tycho. Good morning, Ralph Tycho. I have some superstar kids with me. Uh, these children are like grown men trapped in a, a D1 body. These are future stars like your De- Beckham, like uh, Cal Ripken. We got a, a couple of Tebow's out here. We got a Carl Lewis from Sprinters. These are players that will be ninth grade playing varsity starting. They'll probably have full ride scholarships in the 10th or 11th grade if they stay focused. I'm going to let each kid say who they are. Say your name. Ethan Ekin. Gavin Burleson. Eric Denham. Isaiah Lopez. Calvin Thomas. Brendan Rose. Diesel Hernandez. Michael Thomas. Aaron Thomas. My name's Jeff. Dave Morn. <laughs> These players, are, Ralph, will be getting scholarships from some of the high schools as well as colleges, and they are prospects, not suspects. Nice. Very nice. I just want to tell you, kids, you're in good hands. And... Um, Let's start off, instead of ending this time, I want each child that said his or her name, I, I'm assuming they're, they're all... Uh, they're all dudes. Tell me where you want to go to school. Tell me where right, you want to know. go to school. All right, who wants to go first and where you want to go to school? Okay, we got Gavin. Go ahead, say your name. My name's Gavin Burleson, and I want to go to Louisiana State University. Why? Why? Tell me why you want to go there. Because my uncle played football there, and he's a big influence in my life. Beautiful. What's your uncle's name? Michael. Okay. Jackson. Michael Jackson. All right. Um, (laughs) I don't remember. I think think Charles Barkley might adopt him. I remember him dancing around the line of scrimmage. He must have. Um, M- Michael Jackson. Next you can time. go to uh, um, you can go to uh, Instagram and see these guys playing football this Saturday, as well as YouTube because their uh, games have been posted. So they have a fan following between two hundred and two hundred thousand people are following them, girls, kids, and coaches. The next kid is oh, Eric Denham. Eric Denham. Where do you want to go to school, young man? Um, Oregon University. Okay. Um, have you been out to Oregon? Yes. Okay. What What impressed you about it? I like I like the campus. I like the school part of it, the education part of it, and I like the football team. What do you major in? Right now, he's made, majoring in Under Armour or Nike because one of them are going to sponsor him, and he's oh. got it all on. <laughs> he's got a little bling going. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So we're talking blue chippers here. Is that what you're saying, yep. Lenny? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, beautiful. Please, kids, do, do not. Blue chippers, gold chippers, I don't care what you want to call yourselves. Don't forget your education, like Lenny says. That's the whole purpose of dealing with a Len Randall. There's a, whole, there's a bunch of academies, a bunch of humans. Lenny's going to stress education. Next child, if you would. His grade point average is, go ahead and tell him, 3.5. I got a 4.0. Oh, okay. Nice. And Gravin has a 4.0. Okay. And wow. the next kid so is. I had only a little two. Now, this is an interesting next kid, Ralph. I got J Lo, George Lopez, and we got a Lopez here. I don't know if he's related yet, but I'm going to try to get him a royalty check from Hollywood. You My name is Isaiah Jay Lopez. Lo. This is all right. Isaiah Lopez is his name. Yeah. All right. Hey, nice to meet you, Isaiah. Where do you want to go to school? I want to go to Stanford. 
Wow. Big aspirations. Um, have you been up there? Up, this is my neck of the woods in Northern California. Have you been up here? Yes, I have. Okay. And you were impressed, obviously. Yes, I am. What did you like about them? Can I tell you guys something that, that may help? If you start decide walking back. in a place to go to start school, walking back. get their gear and wear their gear and picture yourself there. Always think about yourself in the in the future as if it's happening. Actualize it. Visualize it and then actualize it. And it really helps keep on track. We do visualization here, Ralph, and when we do visualization, half of them fall asleep after 30 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but the other half is taking it in. You can't yeah. please everybody. <laughs> it's often, awesome, though. Yeah. It is often. It, it is. In, in life, it helps. Just picture yourself where you want to be rather than where you are now, and and then just go for it. Our next kid is Diesel. We call him the Diesel. He's a pitcher slash tight end slash linebacker. All right, go ahead, Diesel. Tell me who you are. Hi, I'm Diesel, and um, I want to go to Stanford. Okay. How old are you? Um, 11. Oh, so you have a ways to go. What are you doing on a regular basis to make that happen? Well, I go to practices, and I go to, like, pitching lessons and hitting lessons. Okay. And do you have fun with it? Yeah. Is it fun? What's the most fun you have? Which, what is the most fun you have? Well, it's kind of just being, being, being out there and, like, pitching. And controlling the game. All right. Cool. Who's your favorite pitcher? Clayton Kershaw. And who's your favorite instructor in the whole world? He wears number 11 with the Mets. Um, it's probably Lenny Randall. All right. You win. What does he win, Don Pardo? He wins a baseball glove from Lenny Randall. Who's, who's next? Nice to talk to you. You're very articulate for 11 years nice old. Nice to talk to you. Go. All right. Here. Who's next? Gabe is next. All right, Dave. Here we go. Now we got uh, we got Calvin. Uh, we got two, three brothers, sets of brothers. This is Aaron. He's the oldest of the trio. But they're from Texas. His dad you talked to from the military the other day. Oh, terrific. Your dad is wonderful. Nice Thank to you. meet you, son. You too. All right. Very, very cool. And you got um, – is there competition between your brothers, you and your brother? Of course. Of All course. Right. Good. Every day. And every day. And your parents don't play both ends down the middle. <laughs> um and so they support you all equally, am I correct? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, parents are evolving these days since I had them back in the old days, in the 50s. Um, we didn't have the same ones, but <laughs> never mind. Um, maybe my brother Bruce is listening and can hear this. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's a defensive back, Ralph, your... wide receiver, and a sprinter. Ah, very cool. Very cool. So what do you like doing the best? Ball I like playing sport. wide receiver. Or, well, football and wide receiver because that's what I'm best at. Okay. And, and I always love getting the ball. Every play. Because my team, we love passion. So I expect the ball every play. Beautiful. Beautiful. Just mow them down. Where are you going to go to school? Uh, Texas A&M, because my dad went there. Okay. And you, all all the brothers are going there? Yes, sir. Oh, wow. You're, go, you're going to be a dynasty, a mini dynasty right there. Mm -hmm. um, that's terrific. Good luck to you. Uh, like I, Lenny said, okay. I met your dad on the phone 
the other day, and uh, you're in good hands. Now you're going to meet the other brother. His name is Michael. Michael, I'm Ralph. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Okay. What's your favorite sport? Football. And tr- okay. football and track. And track. What's your, what event do you compete in in track? Um, I, um, I, I joined the, um, one, no, yeah, 100, 400, and the 150, and the 4x1 relay race. Okay. How old, and how old are you? 11. Okay. And are you happy with the, the family decision of Texas A&M, or are you thinking Alabama? Texas A&M. I'm trying, I'm going to see whether it's Texas Tech, Central Michigan, or Texas A&M. Oh, so you are looking at other options besides Texas A&M. Yes, sir. Very interesting. uh, You might end up not just playing with your brothers, competing against your brothers. Um, We were were going to try and go to the same college to see if we could be on the same team for once. Go back right. guys, back Beautiful. Next um, one is Calvin. The youngest is Calvin. He's met, and uh, this is the other brother. All right, Calvin. Oh. Calvin is uh, 19 going on 10. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> well, 10 going on 19. I was 19 going on 10. <laughs> Hi, my name is Calvin. Very College nice. I want to go to is right, Texas Tech, Texas A&M, right, or uh, Michigan State. Michigan State. Now, what? That's totally uh, that's totally um, away from it. It's out of the South, so to speak. What made you uh-huh. think about Michigan State? Yeah. I have some guys I want to bring in here. Okay. What made you think about it, Calvin? Um, because I was born there. Oh, and okay. So, uh, that's a very, very good reason. And what an excellent program that is as well. Um, <laughs> what, what are you going to pay during the school? Sir? What do you like to do? Huh? Besides sports, huh? what do you like? What interests you? I can hear you. Okay, besides sports, what is it that interests you in school? Um, I do not, I don't know. What? What do you say? Okay, uh, that's, uh... Um, He's only a fourth grader, sorry. He's a fourth grader. Know, but you'll find out. Oh, okay. Cool. So, is Lenny there? Is yeah, Lenny who's that? Yeah, Jabari. Jabari, who's a wide receiver, DB. His brother's the ninth greatest player varsity quarterback. He's also a spokesman. He's kind of like a, uh, remember Rick Fox with the Lakers? Yes, I do, as a matter of okay, fact. Kinda, he's kind of like a Rick Fox but or an Aaron Judd kind of, or, or an Aaron Judd kind of guy with, yeah. the, with the Yankees. Yeah, he's got an Aaron Draft look-alike. Go ahead. Not, not a bad look. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Where do you want to go to school, young man? Uh, college? Yeah. I would like to attend the University of Arizona. Ah, I know someone who went there. Number 11. Lenny. That's, he went to Arizona. He went to Arizona State. Oh, that's right. He went. He went to state. Why? Why Arizona? Just out of curiosity. Because uh, that's where my father went. He played football there, and I just want to uh, follow his footsteps. Oh, that's a great aspiration. That's a great aspiration. Um, obviously, your dad taught you uh, early on football. What's his name, and when did he play there? Um, his name is Samuel Ferguson. He. Um, Got a scholarship there, and then his freshman year he had um, broke his collarbone, and then he had played a few games, and then he had went to the Navy. Oh, 
Okay. I went, tell him I went to the Air Force, and together we protected the country. Yes, sir. Okay? And thank him for, for his service. But I, I, I don't know the, um, what year it was off the top of my head. Okay. What do you like to do if it, it, when you're not playing sports? What interests you? What interests you at school? Uh, school was? Pardon me? Why is it just hobby? Oh, okay. All right. And um, if it weren't for sports, what do you think you'd do in life? You want to be a football uh, player? You, you want to pursue it? But if, if sports weren't there, uh, what would you do? I've always had an aspiration for um, being a plastic surgeon. Really? So, um, if if I don't get a scholarship from um, Arizona, I'm going to go to UCLA to get a, um, a doctorate. Okay. That, um, that's terrific. And you know what? Even if you do get a scholarship, someday you can go to UCLA for that doctorate. Yes, sir. You do both in life. Beautiful. You're very articulate, and I wish you a lot of luck. Thank you, sir. Uh, here goes Chris Evans. All right. All right, Len Leonardo. Okay, my next guy is Gabe. Oh, wait. Okay, all right. You there? Are you there, Ralph? Yes, I am. Okay, I have a very – that John Hardy, who played with the University of Hawaii. He's a pro football player. He played in the Arena Football League. He played at Vista Marietta and the CFL, and he tried to take my house up in Idaho. I can't tell you the details of that, but uh, he's trying to get the keys today from me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here is uh, John Hardy. Uh, go ahead. Hey, nice Ralph to Tyson. meet you, John. You're certainly at a different level than, than these guys. What level <laughs> do you want to get to, and how is Lenny going to help you? Oh, um, Obviously, the main goal is to get to the highest level, which is the NFL. Um Coming from uh, high school to college to CFL, I got a little taste of it. And I just finished up last year with the indoor football team in Spokane. And um, just just training now. I got a good agent. And just keeping keeping the right mentality to, to strive to, be, to get to the highest level. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, can't say enough of your – enough good things about your choice of instructors. Yeah. Um, Lenny will take you to that next level. And uh, are you having fun with it? I'll ask you that. I, I am. You know, it's it's, it's been a journey. Um, you just got to enjoy it, enjoy the process. You know, it's taking me places I didn't think I'd be at as far as around the world and different states. So, yeah, I'm definitely enjoying it, having fun, doing what I do. Who's most? Uh, may I ask you who's most responsible for bringing you to – the level that you're at now, who taught you as, as a kid? Um, I would say my family and my strong belief in uh, in God, because you know that's how I was raised, I was raised as a Christian. And um, but my family, my mom, my dad, they've been very supportive, and they brought me up the right way, and just been learning, uh, learning, grow every day under them. Beautiful. That's a great answer. Um, as an instructor, was there anybody, a coach, a high school coach, that influenced you? Uh, my high school coach at Vista, Coach Kendall, he taught me a lot of the game. Um, going in, I didn't think I was going to play high school. My mom kind of helped me uh, make that decision. And then Coach Kendall and his program was, was very inviting and very successful and helped me te teach me the game. and how to play it. Beautiful. Who taught you how to communicate this well? <laughs> just, <laughs> uh, I don't know, just probably just the, just the process of being in this, in this field. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, that's, you know, that's ultra important in terms yes. of um, your success along the way. So keep it up. Thank you. I appreciate that. Can you give me your phone back to you, Lenny? Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, Ralph, our last guest is, uh, who did we get, Brandon? We, we didn't get Brandon and we didn't do Eric. Brandon is a uh, 
Wide receiver, three touchdowns a game. He's about 6'1 already, I think, in my future. I think he'll be 6'5. About 240 right now. He's, he looks six feet on the court. He has a slim, Cal Ripton type body. I'm going to teach him to switch hit, and he's also a quarterback. So he's like the package. This is Brendan. He'll tell you where he wants to go to school. Hi. Uh, I want to go to school at Oregon University. Okay. Because that's been my favorite school ever since I was a kid. I always watched them every every weekend. Right. That's always been my favorite school. This one yeah. at your at your age. How old are you? No, no, I'm I'm five eight. Oh, okay. He just. I, he I, just I, go yeah, on, no. I, I'm like five eight, five nine. Okay. And what do you I like? I one. What do you like in school besides sports? Um, I'm into science. I like science. It's it's interesting. I like doing like labs. Labs are fun. Good. So uh, studies are no problem. You're you're disciplined and you're you're learning enough that um, getting into it, getting a scholarship will be no problem. That's terrific. Um, yeah, I got a 4.0 right yeah, now. I, I can tell. And, and I had a 4.0 last year, so, yeah. Terrific, terrific. What other sports do you play? I play football, baseball, and a little bit of basketball, but it's kind of veering off a little bit. Okay. What do you like the the most? Not what you're good at, but what do you like the the most? I'd say, I'd say baseball and football are about the same. Okay. About the same and for both of them. Are there things you learn in baseball that help you in football and things you learn in football that help you in baseball? Uh, Yeah, just having lateral quickness and everything like in baseball. Like I play okay. center field and short stop, so you got to be able to get to the ball quick. Absolutely. And playing in football, you got to be. very important. Yeah. And uh -huh. in football, naturally, it's equally important, first step, step quickness. Um, yeah. Terrific. Nice talking to you. I wish you the best. All right. Nice talking to you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Got you, Ethan. Got you. Did we do yeah. you? Okay. All right, Ralph, we got uh, last last but not least, we have um, – did we do Gabe? Gabe's, uh, Gabe's, Gabe's talking with uh, with John Hardy. He's doing a personal interview because some of the kids are going into sports journalism and they're going to learn how to talk, ask questions, and how to be like a journalist or a broadcaster. Like, well, uh, they're, they're well equipped. Each and every one of these guys are very, very articulate. It's not just – it's not just sports with you, Lenny. It's just it's an all around. You're developing all around humans. It's terrific, it really is. Okay, let me introduce John to the group. Everybody to your desk, to your chairs, unless you want to talk over here, John. Your choice. All right, you go. I want you to relax. I want you to relax. The funny thing about this, Ralph, is all right when you have a special guest in. We have some kids that some are grateful, some are requesting burgers and fries while I'm talking to you. I haven't heard thank, thank you yet. One guy goes, can I get some chili on the side and no meat and then a, a, just a virgin burger? And can I get fries with chili on it? In-N-Out burgers don't serve like your personal person, do they? Uh, we have an In-N-Out burger in Alameda, Lenny, amongst all the, all the other accoutrements that I'm inviting you up to, to experience. And they've never asked for chili on the fries, though, right, in, in Alameda? All right, guys, take the floor. You guys know who our guest is today, right? Yeah, he played in the CFL. All right, CFL, NFL prospect. He's in Arena Football League right now, and he will be in the NFL if he continues to be up. Former Vista great, John Hardy. Go ahead, guys, far away. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm going to go get them a chili burger from Alameda by my helicopter and come back. <laughs> Hey, Lenny, terrific. 
Thank you. God bless you, man. Shalom. God bless you. I, I, Are you fan? Uh, it was fun to, get, to talk to these kids while they're still kids. You know what I mean? I, I talk to people who are formed, um, and these kids are, uh, they have a head on their shoulders. They have a direction. They have a compass, and um, that's so important. It's a, it, We have 40 kids waiting to get in this homeschool. It's a homeschool. We train from 8 in the morning till now, and then we have a snack, and we have a special guest. We just ran no hit. We're in the mountains and the hills. I'm going to send you pictures of each kid, and they didn't like running in weeds. They didn't like running in the dirt. They didn't like running in a couple, couple rocks. I'm going, guys, this is a reality check. We're in a $4 million complex, all turf, weight, high-end, monster-sponsored, with uh, Rockwell race, uh, motocross races in here. And these people are serious about life. I saw a baby, Ralph, seven years old with the mom and the dad on a treadmill. <laughs> 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 treadmill. And then they gave him a little tiny five-pound weight. <laughs> a five-pound weight. He went from one end of the floor with the weight and one end back. And I had to ask the mama, what is your plan? <laughs> she goes, T-ball. <laughs> Let me get serious a second. Let me get serious. A seven-year-old. The first academies I ever heard of in sports were the tennis academies. John Ballesterio, whatever his name was, in Florida. They got got a lot of mixed reviews in the sense of kids being bred, um, this, that, and the other thing. A lot of negativity about that. What do you guys do to avoid the downfalls of early academies? How have they advanced? Ralph, we put 400,000 kids in college first. We don't even think about the sport. The sport is a vehicle to do something else. Strictly that and nothing else. So get your degree. That means you got to get a scholarship, D1, D2, uh, go to the military scholarship, accomplish something. It doesn't have to be the greatest. Be at the top ten. Top 100 of whatever you're doing. Because there's only one or 2% chance of you getting in the pro ball. Don't let pro ball be your, you know, I know we dream about it. We do uh, visualization. We do all that golfing and we tennis and, and rugby and soccer. We all want to be great and we all want to be like Christian Ronaldo. And it's funny that everybody can't be that. Everybody can't be Kobe or Larry Bird. Or they can't, they can't be T-Ball. They can't be Tom Brady. So, you know, there's the Vatahas and the and the, uh, the Berkley, the Barclays, and you know, there's different guys. Bakley was the guy with the Cowboys catching the bat ball on the back of his, his neck. <laughs> you know, there's guys that you not just come up, there has to be a better word than academy for what you do. In the we words, have a, it's called a training facility. We have a sports training facility, personal training, sports rehab. Uh, sports medicine, chiropractor. We get the whole body ready for, you don't even have to play the sport if you just want to stay in shape. Right now, Ralph, we have America and, and a lot of countries have an obesity problem. We are, we've gotten kids that were 280 pounds in here. Now they're like 150, okay? We, it, and it happens in like two months or a week, depending on what they work with after they leave us. See, we have them Monday through Thursday from 8 to to, to, to two, and then at okay. three, Plenty three to five, they go going to yeah. football practice. Go ahead. Sorry. I know. Um, I've been doing this with you for three or four weeks. I know of the greatness of all this. How can people get in touch with you? I don't. I don't want to forget on these segments. Um, let us know an email. Let us know a. Um, uh, you're on Facebook. Let us know how we can get get you. I have four Facebook pages, actually five, and the one of them's with uh, Vince Scully, and one's in Italy, and another one's here in uh, in the United States, and then I have uh, Instagram, the most interesting man in Major League Baseball, MLB on Instagram. I post the kids, I post their parents. I had a parent cry to me, whose whose uh, daughter's at Washington State, and she was crying because she doesn't like Washington Pullman because she's homesick and they don't like the way they have nothing to do up there. 
See, kids have to have a social life as well as an athletic life and an academic life. If you're in a library all day and you don't interact, you become a nerd. You can become a house. The Arizona State Library. Yeah, that one's a disco. Okay, <laughs> it's a modified library if you go to Arizona State. <laughs> right. <laughs> Lenny, so, the, I, they, they can read the, uh, I know. I, see, I know your comic background. You don't, may not know it, or may have forgotten. I did comedy for a lot of years in the eighties. What do you mean, Jed? You're still doing it. You haven't stopped. You do it. I think you laugh. I know you're a great comedian because <laughs> you listen. And uh, to be a comedian, you have to appreciate other other things. And just once or twice on each show, I make you laugh out loud, and that makes me makes me happy. <laughs> 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 but. Um, I can't wait to get up here so we can uh, commiserate about what a tough life we have uh, <laughs> together. Oh, my God. Where are you going to be tomorrow, you... Lenny? Well, Johnny Lott, the, guy, uh, the owner of uh, the, the, the W train facility, who's from, you met, he was with Mandela. He has a son that we're going to go watch in uh, Chabuca near Forest, Forest Lake out near uh, Anaheim area. And Mission Viejo, so we're gonna go see this 19 year. Well, well, the school's been there 19 years, and the kid's 15, but he's gonna be on the varsity, and he's a, a fullback slash guard. So they don't know where to put him. Should he be a fullback or should he be a guard? Because he's being trained by us, and he's fast. I mean, so when you get a big brute, remember the back in the day when you had your Larry Zonkas. And you had your uh, Franco Harris's 6'3", 250, right. 280. Oh, yeah. And, they ran the, yeah, and, and you had your bus <laughs> with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Well, we found a bus. <laughs> we found a – picture of Gronk carrying the football like a, like a halfback. Wow. Can you, can you picture Gronk running a – yeah. So his, his dad's uh, from South Africa, and he's um, – He's going, Lenny, you know, everybody thinks I'm Justin Timberlake because I got that look, but I'm South African, and I can't sing a lick, and I'm trying to get everybody to watch my son. <laughs> okay. And he's, I'm going to ask you something. Lenny, I always hear, I always heard all my life, you can't teach speed. You no, we can't. Teach, you can teach tell speed. Tell us about that. Yeah. Tell us about okay. that. There are 17 guys right now, including Elijah Penny with the – with the um, Arizona Cardinals. He's come to our facility here in uh, the, the W, and Bradley's trained him in Arizona at Arizona State, and he's trained him in Temecula, Marietta, and in Cerritos. Now, his brother is at – his name Amant Penny, who's a top Heisman candidate. We trained him. He's the number three Heisman candidate at San Diego State University. We trained him. Now, he's 6'4", okay, Elijah, 6'4", 6'3". He was 250, 280 when we met him in that range, 280, 250. So now we got him down to 240. He went from a 4'9 to a 4'6". We worked on his abs. We worked on his core. We worked on his obliques. And he wanted it. We ran hills. We ran hills today. I'm not talking your daddy daycare hills. I'm talking like straight up Frank Cush Hills or Mount Sack or Mount Rushmore of St. Helens, Olympia Mountains. Do they have mountains in Alameda? <laughs> I'm not uh, talking no, vineyards. It, it's pretty flat, but the hills of Oakland, uh, which are readily, you know, easily seen from Alameda, um, there are... Picture running that hill. Picture running that hill, Ralph, going straight up that hill, 10 or 20 times a day, or 40 or 50 times a day. And pitchers going up there backwards. Didn't, the sta- didn't they run up and down the, st- the stands in the stadium when you played? We did the stadium 15 minutes every day up the stadium stairs. That's what helped me my punt and kickoff returns. I ran with J.D. Hill, Danny White. We all ran the stadium. It was like a privilege to run the stadium stairs. It made you quick, your feet quicker. You know, you stepping over a runner, you know, trying to tackle you, a, 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 a tackler. It was great to run the stadium steps. We started all the way the whole stadium. One corner of the stadium all the way down to the other side of the stadium is the other side of the field. We even did the Coliseum. 
up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. I mean, it was fun. You know, our reward was uh, burgers and fries and a salad <laughs> at Sizzler. <laughs> Yeah, but it was a fun what's period. What's going on in your head? You're, you're progressing from day to day, and um, yeah. that's what it's about. Yeah. Getting and there. you want it. You got to want to have that passion. Like, like I was, I was with Jim Brewer the other day, and his passion is comedy, and he's a fun, former player. You know, a lot of guys have passion to, to do stuff, and once you get well, that passion, it's, it's call awesome. Jim Brewer and bring him on the show. We'll talk comedy. Well, presently his wife has cancer. I was trying to get him on today, but she, he's in the cancer facility right now, so it's going to take us a little while to get treatment for her, and then he'll come on. We plan on doing a show together, a live show on stage, either Vegas or New York. Well, um, there you go. We're great minds think alike. I hope his wife uh, does better. I hope she's um, able to recover. That's the best you can say. Or not suffering too much if she's not able to recover. Um, it's, a, it's a beast. We had a great time with, together. His wife and family are phenomenal, and his brother, uh, Dan. They're just a great family. They really are. Yeah. All right, Leonardo. Uh, thank the kids individually and collectively. I uh, so much enjoyed getting answers out of them. It was Really cool for me. Tell them that. Okay, wait till you see the pictures. I'm sending them now, folks. <laughs> Beautiful. I um, will see you tomorrow. We'll talk same time, same bat station. And uh, I put two or three of these together, and uh, two or three times a week I um, I publish them, and we're on iTunes, and we're on um Everything that we do is archived on YouTube. So um, uh, we got a good thing going, and you're adding to it. It's the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm Ralph Tycho, the weak link of all of it. It's a great network, and I um, hope you'll tune in to the other shows. If you're listening out there, ComfortablyZonedRadio.com. Be well, everybody. Thank you again, Lenny. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Donato in Germany, for listening, all you people in Sicily. Grazie, grazie. Uh, yeah, Donato, th thank you. We had a great interview, Donato um, <laughs> and I, two or three weeks ago. And um, I'm glad you listen. We are um, international, as you yeah. have been for, what, 40 years, 30-some-odd years in Italy? 30 yeah, 31 years, and we're doing Spain with a lot as with Sosa. So that'll be another show coming up. So get ready for that one, folks. Wear your sombreros. All right. <laughs> All right. Lenny Randall's Hot Corner, Comfortably Zone Radio Network. Adios, everybody. Ciao, ciao. We're back. Lenny Randall's Hot Corner, and it isn't always a pleasant day in Lenny Randall's life. He's here um, at his cousin's funeral. Lenny, my yeah. deepest condolences. Um, we're going to muddle through um, at your uh, request. I want you to tell me something about your cousin and, that, um, and the loss that you're feeling. It's kind of hard to talk because I don't know what's going to come out today because we were like brothers, you know, right around the corner. My mom and, you know, of the, of the seven sisters that she had, all of them had four to eight kids, and we were really close uh, every day. I mean, going to school, different schools, and every Sunday church, you know, post-church dinners, lunches, and sports, you know, it was just part of our life. And uh, George was the first one that, to go to Vietnam out of the group. And we would then go into college and he'd go into war. So it was kind of tough between uh, 15 to to 18 to realize, you know, we may not see him again then, and now we don't see him again forever. So it was it's really tough. And his, and his brother Emmett, you know, we're all the same age, you know, one year apart of you. And uh, it's kind of weird that uh, – 
you know, you start thinking about yourself. You, do you slow down? Do you speed up? Do you look the other way? Uh, do you, you know, George was effervescent, uh, happy-go-lucky, you know, he's a going guy. He's a big helper, big, big uh, helper to the Donald Hunt Center and the, and the Bradley uh, uh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry if you lost. So, so, so what was that? A lot going on. We're just a close-knit family, and uh, everybody was not like today's family. Just a totally different thing. We met on Sundays. We did a lot of stuff on during the week, and uh, you know, we, there were five people we could always rely on. There's always five people in the circle when things got tough or rough or bad. It was always it was George, Edge Bennett. George is always there for you. He's, uh, his sister uh, Elaine and his brother, brother uh, Emmett, and Emmett worked. Uh, you know, they had they had a great little circle. Emmett, Emmett worked for the hospital, so they kind of had a veterans hospital was their like second home for veterans. They worked <laughs> tirelessly for for this country, so they just did a lot of stuff for a lot of vets. Uh, the family was at the, so even the mom the, worked uh, at the veterans hospital. Yeah. Did your cousin come back uh, from Vietnam okay? Uh, um, you're never really okay with an experience. No, nobody comes back okay ever, just to let everybody know. In the world, uh, Desert Storm, there, no one came back normal. You don't come back normal from war. It's like right now, the people in Florida and the people in Texas and people in the hurricanes, you're never going to be the same. If you ever had a fire, a tragedy, a tragedy of all tragedies in your family, you're never going to be the same. If you had a bomb blow up five feet from you and a kid's leg came off and a head right next to you sitting in your lap yeah, and you're in a I, war, a non-war, I, I, or just a, you're well, never going to be the same. Psychological. Do concert, it doesn't have to be a war. It could be a domestic yeah. thing. These people, poor people in Vegas went to a concert uh, to be happy and hear music and you get some cuckoo um, yep. uh, or either not a cuckoo. He could be a well-planned um, individual who was set up by somebody uh, or paid off. Who knows? They. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's a conspiracy theory. People think uh, somebody shot him early, put him in, and uh, his records too claim to think he did anything. So it sounds like a Hollywood movie, but it's reality. You know, they, there's, there's no, there's no the Denzel. Ammo, and, how do you get all the ammo and all those guns into the into um, the room? I wonder. And uh, don't you have a cleaning woman that comes in? Uh, I always say day. inside job, inside job first, then you go from there. Yeah. There's no way in the world that no one in the world knew that that guy had 10 suitcases, okay? How, did, how, did he, how does one person with you? Is he, is he a family of 10? <laughs> no kids? Right. No, no company? I mean, is he spent the year there or what? I mean, I don't know. Who knew? Who knew? And we, and we never will. Um, but what conspiracy to do what? Why would somebody conspire to do like if one person goes off and he's a nut, you could say, okay, one person, but two people conspiring to do something like this, that's scary. One person cracking up, you get two people, you know, how do you start that conversation? <laughs> Let's, well, hey, Bill, uh, what are you doing for lunch? <laughs> I got something I, I want to run by you. I was at a McDonald's yesterday, I, I, and I was at a lunch. I was getting breakfast for all the kids at the camp. So I'm buying pancakes and hamburgers and, and uh, Happy Meals and uh, big breakfast and all this, and the guy comes up to me and he goes, can you imagine? We have to get, we can't even go in the bathroom now. We have to give the bathroom a quarter or 50 cents so we can go into the bathroom to <laughs> use the bathroom. And he goes, yeah, I just got to tell her one day, and I was, I was trying to give the teller a high five, and there's bars and windows at the bank. <laughs> he goes, we're all scared of each other now. We can't even go to the bathroom at McDonald's and take a leak without 50 cents. 
<laughs> well, that all started so, 911 back 16 years ago, whatever it was, 17 years ago. That's when it all started. I uh, it just changed the um, complexion of this country. I mean, everything was looking over your shoulder, that kind of thing. But it's yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's you know what's going to happen. You're going to go to a hotel. You're going to have to check in. You know, no bags allowed. <laughs> Right. What you wear is what you wear every day, and that's it, and a toothbrush. And, you know, a hundred years from now, we all may be in our birthday suits because we can't, can't have anything. Nobody's concealing. You know, we're all out in the open. Um, it's nuts. And what's really scary is that they have these plastic bombs. Big stadiums, I think, you know, you go to the World Series, you go to a playoff game. They can't control, but they can't test for for plastic bombs and stuff. And if you want to talk inside jobs, um, you know, there's a building that that imploded at around 911 that had wasn't hit by an airplane and imploded. So I know that explosives can be planted by. Um, by folks, and I know that uh, also know that 911. I, I had a gut feeling was brought on. We knew it was like Pearl Harbor. We knew that shit was coming. They, they knew it. Bush knew it when he was reading a book upside down to some kindergarten kids. Um, and that just uh, it's just part of the crazy world we live in. So a movie when I was a kid, it was The Manchurian Candidate. Do you remember that, Lenny? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Frank Sinatra and what have you. Yeah. Now, um, weird things happen between international relationships. And um, we got some weird things happening. What with Korea, Iran. World's... Hey, Lenny, it's going to hell in a handbasket. Land. Well, we we ha what we have to do is we have to uh, try to break the fear factor, have more humor, be aware, but still talk uh, like it's not. You know, you, you, you can still open your door in the morning and at night, and you still got to have a sense of humor about life. So, some kind of way we have to and we make this all turn into a positive. Are, yeah, we're good individually. Chances are really good that you, me, all our listeners will not be affected. Chances are really good, but not as good as they were before. Can't deny that. And, yeah, you got to have a sense of humor about it. And, um, but you combine all that stuff with natural disasters that people are talking about climate change being responsible for, and the powers that be not even considering climate change. Um, I yep. uh, just wonder, just kind of wonder. Well, Al, Al Gore knew something that a lot of people didn't know. And uh, yeah, I, I, Bill Nye knows things that a lot of people don't know. So it's just a question of do you like science or do you just don't care and just go on about your life and business as usual? Because – you don't want to get a migraine to live. You want to enjoy life. So however much time we have, we got to make the best of day-to-day, moment-to-moment. That's why I say every day is your birthday. You wake up, it's your birthday. If you don't wake up, call me collect. <laughs> if you don't wake up, call me collect. I like that one. Love you, Len. Best to your family. Okay, brother. I'll be in prayer for all you okay, people that have you. Okay, take care. Uh, Adios.